Hey guys, this is Frank Yetter, and you're listening to Submission Radio. Hey, this is Rich Franklin. What's up, everybody? This is Chris Lieben. This is Diego Sanchez. Randy Couture. Alice Overing. Hi, this is Stephen Bonner. This is Don Fry. Hey, I'm Phil, Mr. Wonderful Davis. TJ Dillashaw. And you're listening to Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. Submission Radio. You're listening to Submission Radio. Welcome to Submission Radio, episode 140. It's Wednesday, the 20th of September. I like to say this, Cass, it's a little bit warmer in Melbourne. A little bit warmer in Melbourne. And as such, a nice sunny episode of Submission Radio for you guys this week. Of course, sunny and sexy. Those are the two keywords. We've got a lot of fun guests to talk to this week. We've got Jason Perillo. A lot of news coming in regarding Cyborg, regarding Ronda Rousey, regarding, of course, Michael Bisping and GSP. Bisping's talking about retirement. So there's a lot of things to talk to Jason Perillo about uh, Don Fry is making his return to the program. I think the last time we had Don Fry was the very start of the year, so we want to get a nice good update on Don Fry. And of course, as is customary, get his thoughts on the current world of MMA, maybe talk about some fun Japan stories. Of course, Yoshihiro Takayama is uh, not doing well physically, so we want to get his thoughts on that, considering Don Fry was linked to one of his most iconic fights with Yoshihiro Takayama. Jorge Masvidal will be making his return to the show. I am very, very excited to speak to Jorge. Last time we spoke mm. was before the Damian Maya fight. He is always an OG and one of the realest interviews. And uh, there's so much to talk to him about. He's obviously fighting Stephen Thompson, UFC 217. There's been this feud between him and Michael Bisping. So I'm curious about that. What is his position in the welterweight division? So a lot of exciting things to talk to Jorge about. Also, how's he doing this time of hurricane? So I'm, I'm curious and excited to speak to him. Connor Rebush, a first addition to Submission Radio. Never had him on the show before, but very excited. He is the striking expert of bloody elbow and bad left hooks. So we thought we'll bring him on to discuss this Canelo Triple G fight. And of course, more importantly, Luke Rockhold's striking style. A lot of criticism about his striking defense and the way he looked in that David Branch fight. So we thought, hey... We'll get someone who's much, much, much smarter than us when it comes to striking and boxing to break it down. Was his defense really that bad? How good is his striking? How would he look at 205 if you decide to move up there? So a lot to talk about. And there's more. we got a lot of things to talk about amongst ourselves. And we get another guest, don't we, Dennis? That's right. The Submission Radio Buffet Team Circa 2016, a major part of it, joins us back on Submission Radio. I'm, of course, talking about Damon Martin. The mm. guy is an absolute killer. He's been killing it with nerdcoremovement.com and, of course, Fight Society podcast, his work on Flow Combat, etc., etc. He's going to come on. There's some stuff to talk about. We want to get into this whole Edmund wanting to see Ronda Rousey fight Chris mm. Cyborg thing. Uh, Michael Bisping possibly retiring after 217. Say what? What about Adelaide Bird? I mean, the beautiful town of Adelaide here in Australia, the city of Adelaide, and I feel like Adelaide Bird has kind of given a bad a bad vibe to the to yeah. the name Adelaide, and she may be judging UFC 216. So we'll get okay. Damon to weigh in on that and figure out what is going on with that because. We can't have her affecting any of these important fights. And we'll also talk about what's next for Luke Rockhold. You know, we'll be talking with Conor about his defensive style and talking about his future at the end of the episode. So a lot of stuff to stick around for, Cass. Yeah, absolutely. A fun episode of Smish Raider coming at you. If you do feel like it, if you are in the mood, keep those iTunes reviews coming in. We get a lot of sexy iTunes reviews and we love reading them out. Uh, Don't forget to follow us on Twitter at SubmissionAUS. Our messages are open if there's anything you want to talk to us about privately. Slide into our DMs. We don't mind. We're not Mia Khalifa. We're not going to expose you guys. If you want to make it public, that's cool. Tweet at us at Submission AUS. If you want to follow us on Facebook, that's where all the sexy videos happen. Facebook.com forward slash Submission Radio AU. And of course, if you haven't already, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube if that is where you are watching. And even if you're not, there's a lot of exclusives Mm. coming to YouTube. Uh, The Technique of the Week series, that is gearing up. So we're going to have some fun, sexy techniques coming at you shortly. Not just yet, but shortly. So get excited, everybody. And of course, a lot of other exclusives. So it's all happening. A lot of fun times. Enough rambling. Without further ado, a lot of guests, a lot of people to speak to. And Dennis, I believe our first guest is on the line. You're about to introduce him. All right, guys, our next guest is the boxing coach to such fighters such as BJ Penn, Tito Ortiz, Michael Bisping, and Chris Cyborg, amongst others. With a massive 2016, he is looking to have another stellar year in 2017 with some big fights on the horizon. Jason Perillo, welcome back to Submission Radio. It's great to have you, coach. What's up, fellas? How are you guys doing? Doing good, man. Always well when you come on the program. And uh, we were on Perillo Boxing 
uh, on Instagram. And every time we go on, it is a literal who's who of MMA fighters training with you right now. You got TJ Dillashaw, you got RDA, Michael Bisping, of course, a regular customer. Tell us, what, what has the last year been like for you? Because it seems like you're in even higher demand than usual. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, it, 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 it's the funny thing is that I've always been in the gym. I've always been holding the half heads. I've always, you know, I back even when I boxed myself, I've always been training people. I mean, yeah, it's a little different. And the names are a little bigger, and it's a little bigger high-profile fight, you know. So, obviously, the guys that are in there draw a little more attention. But realistically... Whether it's who, who and the, who's who in the zoo or or whatever, I, I mean, most likely I'm probably sitting in the gym holding hand pads regardless. So I mean, it's exciting. I I, I, I enjoy working with the uh, high profile guys, the high level guys that uh, you know are looking to gain those those extra inches to get to the highest level that they can get to. So you know, it makes you know obviously it makes uh, what I'm doing. Uh, I feel like I'm I, I'm not getting the uh, you know. The the, uh, the final end of what you're looking for as a coach, you know, and that's world champions. Mm, multiple world champions. Let's get into the world of MMA because, of course, there's some big fights coming up for you. First of which is the Michael Bisping fight with GSP in November. We saw you spend some time with GSP and Mike recently on Instagram. What's your relationship like with George? Because it seems like everyone's getting along really well going into this one. Well, yeah, I mean, everybody's a professional. Everybody's been in high-profile fights that's involved, so... You know they get they get it. I mean, it, what happens, you know, out here in the smoke and mirror era where it's not actually in the cage or in the ring where they're fighting. I mean, that's when the that's when all the talk and all the, you know, animosity, anger, niceness, whatever's going on between the two fellows that are fighting. I mean, that all goes out the fucking window now, doesn't it? Mm-hmm. As soon as the guys get in the ring and start fighting, or in the cage rather. Yeah, you know, but I mean, George, I, I I I've been in a high profile fight with George before with BJ Penn when BJ Penn came up from lightweight and challenged him for his welterweight title, you know, and and that was a lot of hoopla as well. You know, we did a three week press tour and traveled all over the place, Canada to Hawaii to Vegas, and you know, so I I I've been around George before. We're amicable. I mean, there's not you know, hi, how are you? It's not like there's a relationship there, but uh. Bisping, you know, gets 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 uh, gets into anybody's head that he's fighting. So there's always going to be a little bit of banter and a little bit of uh, a little bit of fun fun shit talking going on. Sure. What's it like preparing for this version of George? Because I feel like back when you were preparing him uh, with BJ Penn, you knew what you were getting. But now you got this kind of there's there's question marks all around George. He's been out for a while. He's at a different weight class. We don't really know what he's going to look like, let alone look like at middleweight. Can you take a lot of what you sort of learned about George in the past, or do you sort of feel like you're starting fresh? And not to mention that you're training, you know, a completely different fighter and Bisping to fight George. Oh, well, of course, yeah, and yeah, I mean. You, you got to figure he added some wrinkles to his game. I mean, he he, he, he got a. I mean, four years. He, he definitely seems like the type of guy that has has been still in the gym and staying loyal to his craft because he knew at the in the back of his mind there would be a day where he'd want to come back. I mean, he when I, I believe when he left originally left, he always knew in the back of his mind that he was going to come back. Um, for, you know, for some odd reason, he wants to take on Michael Bisping. That's for some reason in, in the back of his mind is his best choice, and he feels like that's going to showcase whatever he's been trying to develop over the last four years. But I mean, really, we got to get Michael to uh, fight his fight for the most part. I mean, we got to be prepared for everything. George is a is a well rounded guy. He can punch, he can kick, he obviously can grapple very well. Hell of a wrestler. I mean, that's obviously that what what kept his titles for all those years. Um, we got to be prepared for everything. I mean, of course, you go back and you look at a guy's habits and what he naturally does. And, and, and I don't know how much George is going to be able to change, you know, some of his some of his habits. Um, but our guess is he's definitely going to add some stuff to uh, to his arsenal. And you kind of hit the nail on the head there, Coach, when you said that George was really focused on getting this fight with GSP. It really seemed like. That was the only fight he was really consider- considering coming back for, which kind of, for a lot of fans, you know, was was a curious situation because here he is a welterweight going up to middleweight to fight Bisping, and, and and really the only fight that he was really interested in. Have you and Bisping had that conversation and kind of spoken about why 
I suppose Bisping is at the top of his list and why he's so adamant about getting this Bisping fight because it, it is a bit of a strange kind of matchup for George to come back to and be so focused on. Yeah, I mean, of course we've had that conversation. I mean, how can you not have that conversation? It is, mm. There is a strange, there's a little bit of a strange obsession there because, you know, there's obviously a lot of other opportunities that he can probably try to get going and bring to the table, but his eyes and is set on, on Bisbing. Obviously, he doesn't want to, you know, he was a fairly big welterweight, and he obviously didn't want to, uh, he didn't want to um, deal with that. that. I'm sure that weight cut was, was a consistent issue for him. And the middleweight division, there's a lot of big beasts. I mean, all the guys that Bisbing's been beating over the last, you know, five, six fights have been all very big men. I mean, much bigger men than George or bigger than, 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 bigger than uh, Bisbing. Mm. You know, so... You know, he probably knows he wants to go to welterweight. I mean, he sees money there. He sees a high-profile guy, a guy that draws a lot of attention, a, guy, a fight that can generate a lot of money, and a guy that, you know, in his mind he feels he can beat. I know that they've uh, trained together 10, 11 years ago, and and I know at the time uh, he, he was getting the better of, of this thing in the gym as far as the wrestling was concerned. I know the stand-up didn't go George's way from what I understand, but the wrestling game definitely was uh, – in George's favor quite a bit. So just, just to confirm, just Jason, like, did, you, did you say the stand-up game went George's way or Bisping's way? I just want to confirm. Uh, Bisping's way. Okay, yeah. From what I understand. Yep, yep. Yeah. Did I, did I, I, could have said, I could have said GSG. I don't know what I said. <laughs> I'm, I, I just start rambling, for God's sake. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's something there's something that he sees. I mean, he, I, he, he's definitely fighting a bigger guy, but not the biggest, biggest middleweight out there. I mean, He's big, definitely a bigger guy than George, but not, uh, you know, like I said, our last four, four, five, six opponents have been, uh, other than, uh, let me take that back, Dan Henderson was was probably smaller than both. I mean, not, Dan Henderson's got a weird, there's something weird to Dan Henderson, man. Weird you don't really know how yeah. big that guy is. But, you know, I, I, you can't tell. I mean, he, I, I, he, he looks like he's, like, sometimes I look at him and I'm like, he's my size? God, for God's sake, what the fuck? And then he's big, you know. He's he's knocking out guys like Fader for God's sake. So yeah. he's kind of a, a, a he's a difficult example to compare him to anybody, really, for the most part. But you know, with that style and that size, it's nice that we were just in front of a guy like Dan Henderson because yeah, he's a wrestler, obviously different athlete than George, but but uh, he he's got a he's got a lot more threatening tools, I believe, and. Uh, I felt Michael handled that fight quite well and, and dominated Dan. I know there's some controversy there because when you see a guy go down, it, there's always going to be some controversy there. But, yeah, I mean, it, George thinks that he can beat, beat Mike. And if you ask me, George's biggest – I mean, what I can take out of George and studying George in the past and looking at George now as a welterweight, what really – I mean, especially in his last fight with, like, Johnny Hendricks, was really – wins him fights too at the end of the day especially these five round fights this is endurance this is obviously he's got a strong worth ethic but you know like that last fight with Johnny Hendricks you know you'd fall behind the first couple rounds and then you just see Johnny completely flatten out start pawing his punches and just not having the same zip on anything he was doing and George just took over and he took over on conditioning he took over on athleticism you know and he took over on, on, on size as well and he doesn't have any of that with Michael. He's not going to have conditioning with Michael. You know, he might be able to... I, I, I don't even think he matches Michael's conditioning. Michael is a conditioning animal, and he's got a heart for days, and he goes for days. So it's real interesting that he really wanted to make this fight for himself. Mm, it is. And the other thing that we want to touch on is obviously Michael making some headlines this week when he was on the MMA Hour, and he mentioned win or lose, this may be his final fight. When did you first find out that this was his plan, Jason? I, you just told me right now. Well, there you no, go. I did read Breaking that. news. <laughs> <laughs> How do you feel about that? He might. Um, he's saying he might retire after this fight. Yeah, it, 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 in all respect, Michael, it's his call. I mean, God bless He's had a career where he makes, you know, he gets to make his last decision on that. And, uh, you know, I'm sure he's got a lot of people, you know, if you care about somebody and you see them have the type of career that Michael has, you think to yourself, you, you did it. You know, you can finish on top and you can walk away, you know, on your own terms. So, you know, that's that's Mike's call. And, and, and I hope he I hope he, Michael does walk away on top and, 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 and whatever decision he makes, I, I, I completely support him.
Mm, and it, obviously he mentioned he's got a lot of projects coming up next year, a lot of film projects, entertainment projects. And exactly like he said, going out on top, it, you know, sounds good to him. But I'm wondering because, the, the, you know, his career has gone for a really long time. You guys have been together for a really long time. We know he's had some injury issues and dips in his run. Have you guys ever spoken about retirement before? Is this sort of the first time that you're really sort of hearing these headlines of him consider, considering retirement? No, I mean, of course. I mean, you, you talk to any fighter after they've been doing it as long as, as Mike's been doing it. Mm. I mean, that conversation is going to come up. I mean, how can it not? This is not the funnest game in the world. Yeah, I, you know, guys are, you know, they love the the attention, they love the, the fame, the money, the, you know, the excitement and the challenge. I mean, all that's a, 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 a big love, but it's also a real drag, too. It's, it's a little bit of a depressing game, and, you know, it, it's the loneliest sport in the world. It really is. Fighting's, fighting's not a fun deal. And uh, every guy, I mean, guys in their 20s are talking about retiring, and they've only had a handful of fights. But, I mean, it, it, it's a tough game. you gotta you got to respect a man like Mike that's done it as long as he has. And uh, he really can make any decision he would like to make about that. And, and anybody else's opinions really doesn't matter because he's been the one that's been doing it for as long as he has. He's the one that's made the sacrifices with his family, with his friends, with everything in his life. So, uh, you know, you, if, if, he, if he started getting that momentum going that direction, you know, it's definitely a thought. And why wouldn't it be a thought in his head? I mean, he's done enough. He really has. And, and that's why he deserves a fight like a George St. Pierre fight, which is a high-profile fight. should generate a lot of money. And it's a competitive fight. I mean, GSP is a favorite of the fight as well, so you can't knock Bisbee for taking this fight. You know, if Bisbee's a 7-1 to favorite, talk shit on the guy. Say, what the hell are you doing? Come on, fight this guy, fight that guy. And if you look at the divisions all over the board, so... The fight makes sense, actually, at the end of the day. And if he's if he's the underdog, you can't talk shit to him for taking the fight. So, regardless, he deserves a good fight, a good high-profile fight, a good paying fight, and then he can make whatever decisions he'd like to do. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the other interesting thing about this is in interviews, GSP has said that if he loses this fight, he may uh, stop fighting as well. He may retire as well. So have you heard those comments from GSP, and what do you think about the possibility of a double retirement in November at UFC 217. Oh, what a pain that! What a pain the ass that would be for the middleweight division. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that'd be pretty exciting. Um, well, you know, because I think that's the pressure that George wants to put on himself. That's the type of competitor he is. He's just like you know, yeah, I'm going to show. You know, you heard his interview. I'm going to should be the better George George Sapir than I was in the past. You know, blase blase, what he says, and. uh, you know, he's a thinker, so he knows if he comes out and, and, and he is a performer or he wants to perform and he gets outclassed and, or beat really badly, my guess is he could see the retirement. I, he, you know, he had the opportunity also and the, and the option to go back down to 170 if things don't go his way with this fight as well. But he's not the youngest guy in the world anyways either. You know, he's, still, he's 35, 36 years old. What is he, 35 or 36 years old? And taking some time off and he's had a lot of fights in a long career. So, I mean, a double retirement, I don't know. Realistically, I'll be, I'll shoot you straight too. Uh, get Mike, even if he, even if he does retire, seeing Mike retire altogether is, 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 is going to be an interesting thing. Cause Mike does love the fist fight, man. That's something that he lives, breathes and, and loves to do. So, you know, a double retirement would be fucked on the middleweight division, but <laughs> yay. How exciting is well, speaking about the middleweight division, you know, as Aussies, you know, we, we'd get killed if we don't ask this. Where does this leave Robert Whitaker? I, I mean, I know, because a lot of people are wondering, you know, first of all, the guys were supposed to fight each other in Melbourne, UFC 193. That, of course, fell through. Unfortunately, Mike had to get a, an injury fixed up. And now a lot of people are really looking forward to possibly that fight being unified. So have you and Mike spoken about Rob? And is there any real interest from him in fighting him? Because... Of course, there's the argument of, you know, Rob's a fairly new name in the game. It isn't a big fight like the GSP fight, you know, not as much money to be made. So maybe there's a lot, a little bit less motivation in fighting a guy like Rob after GSP. Well, I mean, yeah, but, you know, Rob's earned it now, didn't he? You know, he he, he, he took on a couple challenges there and, and he won them in a high fashion. And, uh, 
you know, the guy obviously shows a lot of character. I like his personality, man. He seems a re- like a really down to earth guy, and you know, maybe because of how how quick he struck it and, and, and how quick he got there, he, he's able to keep his humility and his character right now. Hopefully, that doesn't change because he seems like a, a pretty solid guy. Um, yeah, why wouldn't it interest? I mean, the, all fights interests are, are interesting to Mike. If, if, if again, I say it time and time in, in interviews, I, I've never heard of Mike turning down any type of fight. So, you know, if, if, if that's the way, if that's where the promotion wants to go and that's what makes the most sense and, and Mike's still excited about fighting and wants to continue his career, then that'd be, I think that'd be an exciting fight. I mean, why not? I like Whitaker, and I and I think he does. I think he's been a fan of Michael. To be totally honest, when I hear him talk and when I see him talk to Mike, see, it sounds to me like he, he really has a lot of respect for Mike, and and I I respect that as well. And thought he deserves it. And speaking of respect, obviously, uh, one fight where there's not really any love lost is obviously Luke Rockhold. He had a fight this weekend against David Branch. Just curious what you thought of Luke's performance. There was a lot of criticism regarding Luke's striking, even though he did get the win in the end. I'm just curious what you thought and also how likely it is that there is ever a trilogy fight you know, between Bisping and Rockhold because they're at one apiece at the moment. And um, I, I get the sense that you know Bisping loves sort of dangling this fight in front of Luke's face just to sort of mess with him. Yeah, I, yeah, sure. Well, there's another. I mean, uh, uh, probably unfortunately for Robert Whitaker, that that fight could probably rush to the table quicker. But li, li, but we could be honest too as well. Whitaker's got that title, so mm. um, yeah. I mean, of course, that's I, it, 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 good for Rockhold. He showed some composure. You know, he got hurt, he got rocked, and he was able to, uh, you know. The other guy got, in my opinion, got a little too excited. He 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 could have settled down a little bit and probably did, you know, capitalize on the the, the, the where he had Rockhold in that first round. But, you know, to me, he got a little overzealous and a little excited, and and Rockhold kept his composure, kept cool and calm, and and took over, you know, and uh, did did it earn him an immediate shot at the title? I don't know about that. I mean, but. You never know who gets the title shot, really, sometimes. So you got to just sit back and wait. Mm. And, of course, fans wondering what a third fight would look like. How do you think a rubber match would go down? How do you think it would play out if he did fight Bisping one more time? Yeah, well, you know, especially coming after that last fight, I think Mike beats him again. You know, he, he, if Mike does it, you know, I, I, he's, a, he's, a, he's a little suspect there. I think, Mike, you know, Mike can, if Mike gets to his beard, he can get to him again the same way he did before. I mean, you do it once, you can do it again. Um you know, but Mike could beat him in the long haul as well. You know, if, if they go if they go in the later rounds, you know that's where Mike really takes over most of his fights. So, um, you know, of course, I, I, I the way my mind works is my fighter will win that fight, mm-hmm. and, and I believe that. So, uh, you know, that's my opinion. Appreciate it, Jason. We really appreciate the time. We'll let you go in a moment. Before we do, obviously, we got to touch on the other big fighter at the moment. Actually, got a lot of big fighters, but we'll touch on one more, and that's Chris Cyborg, of course. You know, a lot of uh, a lot of hype at the moment, potentially about Chris Cyborg versus Holly Holm at UFC 219. Nothing official. Can you tell us? Uh, there, have you heard any news from Chris? If the UFC have sent out an offer finally, you know, to to Holm yet for this to to happen? Well, yeah. I mean, obviously they. Uh, he, obviously, there's something getting worked out. I mean, Chris is Chris is a ch- champion, and she's she's a high profile. But she's in the midst of being a very high profile fire, fighter. I should say she's uh, she just she's at the she's at the uh, even though she's been doing a long time, she's been a champion as long as she has, and I'm sure it's you know tiring. But she's at the beginning stage of her 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 uh, high profile status. I mean, mm. so and and I think. I, I know she had the, the last the last couple of fights have been kind of a coming out party for her and everybody getting to know who exactly she is. But a fight with Holly Holmes is, it would be amazing. And uh, I think that would bring a lot of eyes, a lot of attention, and everybody will see exactly what she can do. Um, this last fight, you know, we fought a really awkward girl in, uh, in Tanya Evinger and, and a tough, terrible girl. I think we'll actually do pretty good if they keep her around because, you know, she's a strong, strong girl with a big punch and, uh, and, and a lot of heart, but you know, some people. I mean, even you heard uh, Ronda Rousey's coach talking about it. You, you know, I've heard uh, Holly Holmes' coach talk about it. Talk about uh, Chris as if they, they feel like they've seen something that that uh, that they can beat. And uh, quite cute to me. 
and, and I like listening to their opinion about it because, uh, you know, truth in the pudding and, uh, Hopefully Holly takes that fight, and I, I, I would love people. I love when people eat their words because there's, I mean, to talk about Chris being slow, she's got she's got great speed for her, for for a woman for her weight class. She's got great reflexes. She's a hell of a fighter. The fight is a, an awkward, gangly, big-hearted, tough, durable girl like Tanya Ebinger. There could be some awkward moments in there, so you can think maybe there's some holes there, but. There's really not. Chris continues to sharpen her game time and time again. She's out in Thailand right now on vacation, but a big part of her vacation is training. You know, that's what she does. She's constantly focused on being the best in the world. And she's younger than these girls, and she's younger than Holly, and she's got a lot more left in the tank than Holly does. So, you know, I want I appreciate, too, because I heard a little shit-talking coming on their end, and I, and I appreciate that because what that does for me, it makes my job a lot easier. It really, you know, lights the fire. You know, it, it wakes up the lion and it really gets some motivation going over here on this side. So, you know, God bless. I hope that fight happens because you're going to see exactly who Chris is because you're going to see a girl that, you know, at this point is not, in my opinion, not the, at the best she's ever been, you know, but a lot of people know who she is and, you know, she's a preacher daughter. I personally like her. I think she's a nice person, but uh, she's going she's to be biting off a lot more than she can chew, you know, when she comes in this fight. Mm. And I, I want to touch on uh, some of the comments that you mentioned, especially from uh, Coach Edmund Ronda Rousey's coach. But quickly, while we're still on this matchup, the big question is, striking-wise, who's going to have the, the advantage in this fight? Because obviously Holly Holm, multiple time world champion when it comes to boxing, great footwork. But obviously Chris Cyborg, a, a devastating you know, knockout puncher you know, compared to the Mike Tysons of the world, uh, Finishing girls early, just devastating strike, and also showed that she could be quite calculating in her last fight, UFC 214. So, who do you think has the advantage on the feet in this one? I I, I know Chris has the advantage on the feet. I mean, I know that Holly has a, a long career and and has had her her multiple boxing world titles, and you know she's done very well. That's how she wins her fight in MMA too. But you know she if you want if I if I stop and look back at her last fight with that Beth Carrera or whatever her name is mm-hmm. I mean you know she's sitting in front of a girl that that uh you know is taking fitness classes you know you're you're sitting in front of somebody that, that's not what you're sitting in front of when you're sitting in front of Chris Cyborg Chris Cyborg knows how to make people miss she knows how people make make people pay and she's devastating like you said with her power I mean it, yeah, again, she's going to be biting up more than she can chew. She can't stand with, with Chris. She's not going to be able to do that. She's not going to be able to roll with Chris. Obviously, she's going to be trying to set up her big left kick. Most of her fight, that's where she's got most of her weight in her shots, is that big kick. She's got a decent straight left hand. But, you know, people don't realize how good of a punch Chris takes as well. You know, I put her in there with men that that let her have it, and, and she eats it up and puts it right back on him. So it's it's hard for me to get my mind wrapped around Anybody in MMA right now being better than Chris on the feet because I don't think the girls out there, you know, there's there's easy, there's girls with with accolades, you know, and, and, and I look at a girl like Joanna Champion who who's got accolades and has has a lot of, you know, she 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 puts stuff together maybe a little bit more, but most smaller people do. Most smaller fighters have the agility and the athleticism to to show more dynamics in their striking, but. Uh, but but in all in all realness, as far as the MMA game is concerned, Chris is the best on her feet as far as women are concerned. Mm. And just you know, sort of going off of that, you know, talking about how Chris is the best on the feet, and you mentioned it before, Ronda Rousey's coach Edmund Tarverdian just the other day on the MMA, I was saying that he still wants Ronda to fight Chris Cyborg, and you know, like you mentioned, he said that he believes Cyborg is too slow. What do you, what do you sort of think when you hear that? And I, th- I guess one thing that comes to my mind is that it, in some ways, do you think that's a little bit irresponsible as from a coaching perspective when you see how Ronda went in her last two fights to now say, I want my, you know, my, uh, my fighter to go up in weight and fight an even arguably an even more devastating striker in, in Chris Cyborg. Do you think there's a bit, I don't know, I guess a, a certain amount of care that should be taken in that sense? Well, I mean that's the way that's the way he works, you know. You can't. I mean, when a when a coach is talking about his fighter, you don't know, you don't know how how what works for them, you know. And 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 and, and maybe that's how he gets her motivated, and gets her pumped up, and and believe in herself, 
listening to him believe in her. I don't know. You know, um, you know, guy. You know, they gave. Is it is it better to say? Is it better to say we would never want to fight Chris Cyborg because she'd fucking kill us? You know what I mean? Like it's yeah. probably not good to say that. It's probably pretty irresponsible as well. So mm. if you got to say something, you're probably better off not putting Chris Cyborg's name in your mouth. Probably that probably would be the best thing to do because really. I mean, as far as being responsible or irresponsible and stuff, you know, putting your fighter in a situation where they haven't been in the situation, have been successful in the last couple of situations, you probably want to, you know, wipe off, you know, get them running again a little bit. But, you know, that's not, I, it's not for me to say how he talks and handles his fighters. It's really not, you know, and I've heard this guy get a lot of backlash and a lot of shit. If you ask me, he doesn't see. I mean, he he has a really he has his system that he has with his fighters, and and I'm sure we've we've we don't know about all the success he has because there probably has been quite a bit of success that we don't know about, and uh, a lot of in failures, just like all us coaches, we have ups and downs. I mean, we're only as good as the fighter that we're dealing with, really. You know, but I mean, we got to be able to develop and you make him better. And I don't know if he does that or how he does that. He was doing something right for a while with Ronda, but. uh you know, as far as putting Chris Cyborg's name in his mouth, that's not a good idea. You know, and God bless him. You know, if he, if he you know, if, if you know, who else are you going to call out? You should call out probably the girl that the, the last, one of the last two girls that he fought. That would probably be a better call out. It would be more of an even matchup because the girl that she, he's calling out in Chris Cyborg, I believe, would be old in an old school back back when Mark Coleman was doing it back in the day. I see Chris Cyborg being all three of those girls in the same night. And, I, and I'm being wow. serious when I say that. I believe that. And that's the type of heart that Chris Cyborg has, the type of ability she has, the type of strength, and the type of endurance she does. She really, she's really a special fighter. You know, and, and, and unfortunately, and fortunately, because you know what it's been like trying to get fights for Chris Cyborg? It's a motherfucker. You know, leading up to you say, thank God we're in the UFC because now we got the, the ultimate promotion that, 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 that can draw a lot more attention, a lot more girls, and a lot more opportunities for Chris. Because Chris doesn't get, you know, Chris could, Chris would love to. I mean, she, as active as she is in the gym, she could fight three, four times a year, but she doesn't. And it's not because of the lack of wanting to do it, it's more of getting the opponents to fight. So if we got Edmund, we got, you know, Holly Holmes' team and everybody's team going, wait a minute. You know, maybe we can beat her, and let's say we can beat her. And, and now you gotta, now you gotta fucking, now you gotta cash the check that your mouth just fucking, you know, you just open up your mouth. You know, now you gotta do something, which is exciting to me. Please, please look at the last fight of, of Chris Cyborg. Please, Holly Holmes. Please, the uh, Edmund and 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 uh, Winkle John and the guys that talk about and talk negative about Chris and and talk about how they think their fighters can beat Chris, please take that fight. Please sign the line. Please make that happen. We would love that. That gives us the attention that Chris deserves. That gives Chris the light that she needs to be in for everybody to know exactly who she is and how bad she is. Mm -mm. Well said, Coach. Well, it's exciting times for Jason Perillo and his team of world-class fighters. Guys, make sure to follow Jason on Instagram at Perillo Boxing. Go check out his website, perilloboxing.com Jason as always a real pleasure to have you on the program we know you're a busy guy thanks for squeezing us in all the best and I'm sure we'll be speaking to you soon there's a lot of exciting things happening all right fellas Casper and Dennis take it easy guys this is Chael Sonnen and you are listening to Submission Radio all right guys and next guest is the striking analyst for bloodyelbow.com and badlefthook.com he is also the co-host of the fantastic heavy hands podcast where him and patrick wyman do a phenomenal job of discussing the finer points of face punching he joins us here today to give his thoughts on canelo and triple g and also break down luke rockhold striking and look into a striking defense especially after his return fight against david branch he is connor rebush connor thank you so much for joining us how are you today man I'm doing well. Thank you guys so much for having me. We had a, a weekend of some compelling fights and a lot of like uh, controversial stuff to discuss <laughs> after the fact. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let's get right into it because the first controversial thing that happened in the weekend, I suppose, that we can talk about is the Canelo Triple G uh, decision. Break it down for us. Who did you have it scored for? So when I watched it live, um, I, my preference in scoring tends to be towards clean punches. For me personally. Uh, if I'm watching a round in which one guy lands 15 
not too clean, glancing or light blows that kind of catch the forehead and the gloves, you might only have to land one or two really good clean power shots to outweigh that in my mind. Um, watching it live, I thought that Canelo had more of that kind of work in seven of the of the 12 rounds. I scored it for him, 115, 113. Having just rewatched it today, I thought that a 114, 114 draw was just about fine with Canelo taking the first three and last three rounds and Triple G taking all six in the middle. All right. Well, obviously, we got to ask about Adelaide Bird's score. Can you see any, yeah. any, any, uh, you know, are, are you able to fathom it in any way? And is there any possibility that that's somehow justifiable? Um, it's, it's pretty hard to justify. I mean, in, in my scoring, I wrote down that I had, let's see, I considered seven of the rounds to be potential swing rounds, which means they could go one way or the other. And so if you me- think that means that those seven rounds are by random chance, they would be 50, 50, um, then you could make an argument for either Golovkin or Canelo taking 10 rounds or, or somewhere in that area. But it's pretty improbable that with all those rounds looking different and none of them being exactly the same, but having like similarly difficult to score situations, it's pretty improbable unless you went into the fight with some amount of powerful bias or you were corrupt or otherwise incompetent that you would give all seven of those close rounds to just one guy. Um, you, it could happen, but the weird thing is, is that this, these cards happen all the time in boxing, which is part of why boxing fans are so upset about this. It's not just that Adelaide bird turned in one unusual scorecard. It's that she's turned in similarly wide scorecards for lots of fights. And it seems like maybe because we don't have as many big fights in the boxing world nowadays, but it seems like we just can't get a really big atmosphere kind of fight without some kind of controversial ending, some kind of judging incompetence involved. Uh, no, I don't think there's a very good case for it. I, I, I think a draw is a fine material result. I think the fight felt like it could have been a draw. It was very close all the way through, but it's pretty hard to justify giving 10 rounds to one fighter, especially when, you know, like... Most people do think that if you're going to edge it one way, you might have to go to Golovkin for the volume. She gave uh, Canelo some rounds in which he really did not have uh, clearly superior work than Golovkin. Yeah, and you mentioned, obviously, this is something that's happened in the past. We all remember the Nam fan, Leonard Garcia, disaster of 86. I'm, sure. I'm, I'm still getting over that myself, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. I, I figured we'd ask your opinion on this. Uh, you know, there's obviously the notion and, and the accusations that somehow corruption played a factor. Do you buy into it, or do you think because, you know, Bird has a history of it, it's just a case of poor officiating? I don't know. Honestly, there's not enough for me to, to make a call on what the cause is. Mm. I, I imagine knowing boxing and combat sports in general, but especially boxing sorted history, there's probably some corruption going on somewhere in the boxing world. But that's the tricky thing with corruption is everybody involved does a pretty good job of covering it up and just sort of acting like normal. I would like to see a little more something done. And fortunately, the Nevada Commission did say they're going to put Bird on the bench for a while, but I don't really buy that that means anything. I think it's just to appease the people who are really upset. And when they get over it in a couple of weeks, she'll be back judging fights. It's really the problem is that the commissions, whether they're corrupt or not, they just don't care uh, really mm. about the sports. They, they, they just don't care about the quality of the fights or the fans experience. They they really just kind of. They're essentially low-level politicians, mm. and if somebody is successfully bringing in money for the commission, they'll keep them on. So it's it's the frustration of all fight fans, right? Like, no matter how many screw-ups there are, nobody ever gets fired, nobody ever gets suspended or is forced to retrain. You just kind of hope you forget about it. Mm-hmm. Speak to us a little bit about Triple G in this Canelo fight, though. Uh, was there anything about him that surprised you? Were you surprised by the fact that he was pushing forward so much and headhunting and not going to the body as much as usual? And um, what what did you think about his ability to take some of those power shots from Canelo? Mm. Oh, his chin was unbelievable on the yeah. night. I, I, don't, I don't think there's any argument that Canelo landed the two or three best single punches of the night. He had a withering overhand right in, I think, the ninth round that was almost identical to the shot with which he knocked Amir Khan out cold. Uh, he had a massive uppercut. In, as well as a nice crisp short right hand that sent uh, saliva and sweat flying from Golovkin's head, mm-hmm. both in the eighth round. So, yeah, there, there was there was Gennady has his chin to thank uh, for a lot of that. But I also think he he looked pretty good to me. He he looked a little rejuvenated, in fact, having seen how he looked in the Jacobs fight 
And uh, even in the Brook fight before that, they were both a little hard for him. And, I, and it looked to me like he was kind of making them hard on him. He was kind of loading up on his shots, headhunting a lot, even more uh, egregiously than he did in this fight. And so to me, he looked in pretty good shape. He didn't look too over aggressive. He didn't look clumsy. He looked nice and spry like he did, you know, at his best within the last two or three years. And, um, you know, I, I thought that uh, – he he did the best he could with a difficult opponent. Like these guys are kind of made for each other to to take advantage of each other's weaknesses. Mm. And Golovkin didn't go as crazy, I think, for the body because he was worried about getting countered. I think it's also why he didn't throw as much power because he was worried that Canelo would slip away as soon as he committed to something. He fought a smart fight. He tried to keep Canelo on the end of his punches. He tried to avoid taking too much damage in return. Uh, and he mostly did control the ring, and, and he definitely outlanded Canelo, at least in terms of jabs. So he was successful in a lot of uh, accounts. So how you score it really, I think, comes down to what you like in, uh, in a fight and what you like in a round. Mm. Any anything else that sort of stood out to you? Anything any any big takeaways or anything you learned about either fight or anything that surprised you about Canelo? Uh, I I thought it was a fantastic fight. I mean, that's the every every time I look at a round again or rewatch the the thing, I I come away from it with the impression that this was just a like a tactical war between two of the best fighters in the world that that happened to be now fighting in the same division. Um, mm. Canelo's defense, I thought, was absolutely beautiful. He is the only guy I've ever seen stand in front of Triple G for that long with no fear whatsoever and make him miss with almost every single hard punch he throws. And then likewise, Golovkin's chin, his ring cutting, and his stamina continuing to push the pace uh, over the course of the entire fight, it was pretty remarkable too. So I just kind of loved it. Um, <laughs> and it disappointed <laughs> me that there was so much controversy about the scoring with that one card because I thought a draw was okay and, and the fight was so fun. And I just wanted to talk about how fun the fight was, <laughs> but that <laughs> you can never get that these days. Well, I, th I think a big part of it as well is, you know, a lot of MMA fans uh, watch it and to, to MMA fans, um, you know, pushing controlling the ring moving forward throwing at volume to them you know triple g was a clear winner that they, they didn't really look at a lot of the boxing rules and how how it's judged so a lot of people thought it was a bigger blowout than it really was but i mean the big question is and it almost happened in the ring pretty much the rematch looks like it's confirmed it hasn't been put to paper yet but i mean both guys would be stupid not to do a rematch and make that much money again especially after the first fight was so close and so fun so if the rematch does go down are you feeling like one guy will will win it, or is it too close for you to call at the moment as to who would win in a rematch? My my impression is that uh, Canelo Alvarez is the type of fighter who would do you would expect to do better in a rematch. Um, in the same way that where Andre Ward had a really close fight that uh, again I I thought he won against Sergey Kovalev the first time. Many the majority of people thought that he had lost it or that it was a draw. Um, and I said I think he'll probably do better the second time around, and he did. Uh, barring the controversy of their second big fight as well, he still did better, intimidated Kovalev a lot more. And that's because Andre Ward's a very cerebral, thoughtful fighter. Like Alvarez, he really likes to defend and counterpunch and play a sort of slickster's boxing game. And so for that cerebral fighter, I think having seen 12 rounds um, of another guy's offense, having seen a lot of his tricks, having that footage to look back on, and also knowing, like, I stepped into the ring with Gennady Golovkin, and now I know I can take his punches. So now I don't have to freak out or maybe be so panicked next time in the first few rounds. But likewise, I think Gennady, like, with one very small adjustment, that being hitting the body about five times more than he did in this fight, uh, could really be competitive as well. It, it was a strange tactical choice that he did not go to the body any more than he did, especially against a fighter who kind of specializes in having good head movement. You want to you want to hunt that body when the guy's head is hard to find, and uh, it would have been helpful too because Canelo slowed down badly mm -hmm. going down the stretch in this fight. So I think both guys have avenues to adapt and improve, and that's why the rematch is no less exciting to me than this fight was because the joy of watching this fight was just seeing the momentum shift and seeing the small little adjustments each guy was making to keep the momentum from shifting away from him again. Mm. So um, the thinker in Canelo Alvarez, I think, probably has a better shot, but 
it's uh, it's still a great fight between two elite fighters, so it's, it's still hard to call. Mm. And obviously, this may be a funny question, but while we're sort of, you know, in the aftermath of McGregor Mayweather and, you know, even recently mm-hmm. the headlines, there was obviously Joe Rogan talking about, you know, if Conor McGregor fought Canelo or, or Triple G. And even Kevin Lee, yeah. bizarrely <laughs> enough, was on our show recently, and he, he thought that Kevin, that Conor McGregor would actually have better success against Canelo or Triple G than against Mayweather. Uh, do, you, do you want to take the reins from here, <laughs> Conor? I mean... If we recall the the part where the part where Floyd started giving McGregor lots of trouble, you know, like after he he stopped essentially taking three rounds off, was when he started backing Connor up. So I can't mm. imagine how anyone thinks that Gennady Golovkin is a more forgiving matchup for the guy who can't fight as well going backwards. And likewise, Canelo Alvarez, defensively and offensively, is one of the most technically sound fighters in all of boxing. I think it's. It's kind of a joke to assume that uh, Connor, who could not, who got knocked out by a guy who hasn't knocked anybody out in like six years, who was 40 years old and admitted that he hardly trained for the fight. I don't think there's any reason to suspect that he would have any chance against somebody like Golovkin. Although, honestly, if Triple G took a McGregor fight to stay busy while Canelo waits for May, I'd probably watch it. <laughs> Jeez, imagine that. Wow. Well, let's let's make the jump over to MMA because this past weekend, Luke Rockhold also made his return, beating David Branch. What did you think of Luke Rockhold's striking in the Branch fight, specifically his defense? Yeah, um, Luke Rockhold can't fight going backwards very well, huh? Mm. Uh, the, the moment that Branch started pressuring him, I mean, I think that was – I was impressed that Branch did that because that's really not his style. Uh, but I guess he he came into the fight knowing that he would be safer if he were to push Rockhold back. And as soon as he did, yeah, Rockhold just doesn't – he's not comfortable enough in the pocket. Uh, he, he's – what happens is, is somebody attacks him and he pulls away. He pulls his head back so he's kind of off balance. He looks to slap behind after him with that right hook that he likes to throw. Mm. And those are some good tactics – but they're really the only ones he has. And so when a good striker keeps their feet under them and just follows you, like Branch did here, like Bisping did when he knocked Rockhold out in his last fight before this, you need to have more moves. And and more importantly, your first set of defensive moves needs to keep you in a position where you can keep doing something. Uh, And what happens is Rockhold gets pushed back and he's just throwing himself off balance. He's leaning away desperately. He's not really carefully measuring the distance and deciding how big does this movement need to be. And as a result, he just kind of falls all over himself when you really just uh, fight aggressively and push him backwards. And I was hoping that his training with Henry Hoof before this fight would fix that. But it it, it didn't really. (laughs) Uh, There were so many times when I would have loved to have seen Rockhold just step into David Branch with the left hand rather than just running away and throwing his right hook. Um, I don't want to disparage him or say he's cowardly or anything. I'm just saying he didn't have the technique to stand his ground and answer Branch in the pocket. So he was just forced to to run out of it again and again. I didn't like that. Yeah, and I I think you were like a lot of other people where we all sort of thought that I, I don't, well, maybe maybe not you. Maybe you knew it all along. But I think a lot of people chalked up the Bisping loss to say overconfidence and coming back. You would have expected that he, you know, filled those gaps, and it looked like he did it. And I think it, it took pe- a lot of people by surprise. So I'm, mm-hmm. I'm wondering, you know, did this fight against Branch does it sort of give you more or less optimism about how he do in a Bisping rematch? Do you, do you think, you know, I think it was Kenny Florian the other day says that you know the book's kind of been or the, the Bisping kind of wrote the playbook on how to beat Rockhold. Yeah, I I think I mean, I I still think it was it's still safe to say that it was unlikely that Bisping knocked Rockhold out and Rockhold is always going to have a especially being more youthful, but he's also just a physical freak and Mm -hmm. is always going to have a massive athletic advantage over an aging fighter in Bisping who was never really a plus athlete has always been like the hard working cardio guy, Mm -hmm. not the giant with explosive power in everything he throws. And so like. especially when you add in Rockhold's wrestling which is and his grappling and ground and pound which are obviously still in top form I I think it's 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 still closer to a 50-50 fight than it is a fight that favors Michael Bisping but this fight does kind of say to me that going forward Rockhold predictions are going to be very matchup dependent from my perspective it's going to be well do i think this guy is capable of pushing rockhold back if so can he stop rockhold from taking him down when he does that and if the answer to those questions are yes that guy has a pretty good shot of beating luke rockhold mm. 
There's this notion going around, Connor, that uh, Rockhold's boxing isn't very good and it's his kicks that get him by. What What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, I would kind of agree. <laughs> He's mm. I, I, I think the the big thing is people have jumped on saying what Luke said after the Bisping loss, where he said, I shouldn't have overcommitted on that jab or I shouldn't have thrown that jab. That was stupid. And everyone was saying, yeah, you shouldn't have thrown that jab. He was too cocky. And I was thinking, why is a jab such a risky move for you that you couldn't afford to throw it? Uh how how what does that say about how comfortable you are with your hands and your boxing skills that a jab is like so so foreign that you could really really be caught off guard and think that you shouldn't have taken that kind of chance uh that your round kicks are your safer strikes i think rockwell does feel that way and i was hoping that hooft would change that a bit and maybe he still will in time but in this fight it it still looked like classic rockwell to me based on that description he landed good body kicks but when it came to being pushed in the pocket he was kind of uh, a little panicky, a little anxious. Mm, and he, and I think also Branch did a really good job of circling away from Luke's power kicks and sort of being in that mm-hmm. range where when he did throw them, they weren't really connecting properly and a lot of the sting wasn't on them. What did you think about uh, Rockhold <laughs> switching stances? Because it seemed like, I, I, I want to hear from your perspective, do you think he was switching stances so he could land that low calf kick or do you think it was also a defensive tactic? Because it actually seemed to open him up quite a lot. Yeah, I think maybe the idea was... Uh, to open up some kicks. That's, I, I think, a lot of the reason Rockhold switches in the first place. I do think he was also entertaining the idea that maybe he could stop um, Branch's forward rushes when he was in Southpaw, which boxers who switch stances will use that for that, that tactic for that reason as well. Uh, because when you're in, you're in open stance, when one of you is Southpaw, one of you is Orthodox, once you get past that lead foot, the adjustments can get kind of messy. Whereas in an Orthodox versus Orthodox matchup, you kind of have your it's easier to line your lead foot up with the center of your opponent's body to give them a, an obstacle wherever your point foots, your jab can fire or your hook can be thrown. Uh, so I think that's what he was looking for. But I also noticed that he didn't really throw many punches or anything out of those orthodox positions. It, it just kind of seemed to me, you know, maybe we're looking at ring rust here. Maybe Rockhold's long layoff is to blame for a lot of this. And he, you know, was caught cold in the beginning and, and just But to me, he looked like he was he had some new ideas in mind, but he was kind of uncomfortable executing them. What do you how much of this do you think also goes down to his mental state? Obviously, losing to Bisping the way that he has. I mean, you mentioned ring rust, but mentally, is there a little bit less confidence there? When someone moves forward, does he get not I suppose not flashbacks, but does he feel uncomfortable in that feeling because of what happened in the Bisping fight? Yeah, it's quite possible, you know. Yeah, it's it's. I I thought that about some fighters in the past. You know, I thought like uh, I, I remember a moment in the Nick a fight between Nick Lentz and Charles Oliveira, and Lentz, who is nobody has the idea of a, a massive power puncher, cracked Oliveira with a right hand, and to me, it looked like Oliveira in that instant relived his knockout uh, at the hands of Cub Swanson, mm-hmm. and and like. For a second, he hesitated. He turned his back. He was like, oh, it's happening again. <laughs> and, and Lentz couldn't quite follow up. And so he survived and kind of shook out of it. But I, I do sometimes see things like, oh, what was another example? Like uh, Rory McDonald getting hit on the nose by Stephen Thompson. Mm. Um, there have been fights in the past where people kind of psych themselves out because something that's never happened to them happens to them in the most unexpected of ways. So maybe uh, ring rust, a little bit of mental weakness. Who knows? I would hope that Rockhold can kind of shore up those problems and get back on a regular fighting schedule. And hopefully we will start to see some Henry Hooft improvements. Yeah. And I, and I think that happens a lot. Like when we saw Overeem go over to Jackson Winklejohn, we didn't see the improvements initially. And I think with a lot of fighters, sure. you see those improvements sort of, you know, maybe not even one, but like two, three fights down the road. Just sort of overall, I just wanted to get you gauge because for a while now, there's been this aura about Luke Rockhold striking. Um, where mm-hmm. how, how do you think it sort of compares... In the division, you've got guys like, say, Robert Whitaker now. You've got Michael Bisping, who, you know, may not have the most, uh, you know, b- the biggest knockout power, but always been a very good technical striker. You know, even Romero with his unorthodox you know, style, Chris Weidman, solid boxing. Do you still think Rockhold is the best striker in the division, or do you think there are other guys that, um, you know, maybe either more technical or more dangerous for whatever reason? I would definitely say that Robert Whitaker seems like the top guy at middleweight right now. Um, not both kind of in the way that Rockhold was a dangerous considered a dangerous striker before and in the way that uh Bisping beat Rockhold like he's he's more technical but he is also a phenomenal athlete uh mm-hmm. with g- 
great timing, great explosion, great balance. Um, very difficult to outdo Robert Whitaker physically, even when he's on one bum leg, as we saw yeah. in the Romero fight. And then technically, the the difference between somebody like Whitaker on the feet and somebody like Rockhold are the layers. There are so many layers to everything that Whitaker does, and everything is kind of. He's not the most systematic fighter in the world. I think he does a lot of sort of improvising on the fly when he's slipping punches and moving around, but he's good at that. He he always has in his head as he's making a move uh, or trained into his muscles as he's making a move, he has two or three moves set that he can go to right after that. He's in position to make the next move. There's always another layer he can fall back on or advance to to kind of, you know, uh, keep following the flow of the fight. And and that's exactly what we saw Rockhold lacking here and have seen from him in the past, and uh, notably the Bisping fight as well, is that you can he can slip his head out of the way or pull out of range, but when you start demanding more layers of him, when you start demanding he be able to slip and cut tight pivots and block and parry and counter in, in these quick exchanges, his confidence kind of starts to fall apart. And and that's where a guy like Whitaker, I think, would always have an advantage over Rockhold in a striking battle. Mm. And I mean, for a lot of people listening, a lot of a lot of casual fans, a lot of people that don't train in boxing or MMA or kickboxing or Muay Thai. So the big question is, if you're Luke Rockhold, what what are some of the things that he can do in training to fix some of those issues to improve? Uh, I suppose the hole in his game and, and the game plan that a lot of opponents are going to try and take into his future fights. Um. Well, I, I think Rockhold needs to learn to work a good jab. I think he needs to learn how to work multiple jabs in sequence. I, I think a guy with Rockhold's frame, who clearly does like to be fighting from long range, he likes to throw those kicks and, and, and all of that, should be able to enforce that distance or close it at will with a good strong jab. And a southpaw with a good right jab is a very tricky opponent for a lot of fighters. So... Uh, I think he's he's really kind of doing himself a disservice having the build he has, having the style he has, and not learning to have an educated lead hand, to have a jab that can flick, that can measure, that can paw, that can slap, and that can drive home and do damage uh, like he tried to do with the one before Bisping knocked him out. Um, that variety of boxing skill where you don't just say, I've learned to throw the jab now, now I'm going to, I'll wait until an opening for it appears and then I'll throw it. Instead, you say, how am I going to land my jab and what kind of jab am I going to throw and what is that going to set up next and what am I vulnerable to when I throw it? Those are the kinds of answers you have to have in your back pocket if you want to be able to compete with somebody like Robert Whitaker in a striking contest. Mm. How do you how do you see Rockhold doing potentially at, at two hundred five? If he does move up to that division, um, there's a lot of there's a lot of wrestlers, but there's also guys like say Jimmy Manoa, you know Volkan Ozdemir, who is just you know, destroying yeah. people. A lot of people see that as a very, very stiff test for Luke Rockhold. How do you think he'd do up there with his frame and, you know, if, if his striking stayed relatively the same? He's definitely got the build for it. And we have seen a couple of fights now where Rockhold's cardio has not been as good as it was much earlier in his career. So he very well may be getting to the point where 205 is the right division for him. Um, he's a big guy. I mean, he and Chris Weidman are, he and Chris Weidman both out dwarf a lot of guys who have made their careers at 205. So I don't think he would be outsized there. And I think it might be better for him that the guys are kind of slow. <laughs> like The strikers are much slower. There are no Robert Whitakers at 205 pounds, even at the very top of the division. Nobody can go after him with that kind of speed. So maybe it puts a little less demand on that slowly developing boxing game of Rockhold's. Um, and then, you know, likewise... He's still probably going to be one of the very best submission grapplers in the division, uh, especially for people who try to take him down, who think that their only way to, to deal with his frame is to take him to the ground. That's kind of when Rockhold is most dangerous. Mm. When he's lithe, he, he jumps to your back, he wraps up your neck, puts you in an inverted triangle. It's the counter wrestler submission game that he kind of has. And uh, that, that kind of stuff works whether or not your opponents are bigger than you. If you end up on top of them and you can get to their back, finesse counts and Rockhold has that on the ground even if he doesn't quite have it on the feet mm, and just as we let you go Connor we really appreciate your time um for all the sure. Aussies listening I, I take it in in a Whitaker versus Rockhold matchup you're leaning towards Whitaker yes yeah Whitaker <laughs> not, not, one not of my favorite fighters to, but because of it te no, because no. technical reasons one of my favorite fighters to watch in the UFC right now. Uh, I know it happened the same weekend as Gaethje Johnson, mm -hmm. um, and so it, it, it kind of got out, out overshadowed. But to me, Whitaker Romero was one of the greatest 
combat sports things I've ever seen. It was one wow. of the best fights I've seen in terms of what Whitaker had to go through to win, how mentally sharp and composed he stayed despite the injuries and all of that, and how well Romero was able to test him and yet not come out on top. I thought that really showed the quality and depth of Whitaker's game and how prepared he is just to be a professional fighter. He has the mind of a fighter, and I think that really counts for a lot. Uh, so, yeah, I would take Whitaker over Rockhold without without too many second thoughts. Mm. Uh, well, there you go, guys. I think I think, and also with Robert Whitaker, I think a lot of people have been sort of underestimating him. And I think maybe because it's a quiet guy, doesn't really talk trash, or maybe people are always sort of, you know, for that reason, surprised by how well he does and how, how much he sort oh, of exceeds yeah. expectations. And I think the welterweight run as well, I think sort of people still, you know, didn't really expect him to have this level of success. Sure. But there he is. Guys. I'm happy. Mm. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I'm happy to have been one of the few who picked him to be Jacare. So I've been on the train for a little while, at least. <laughs> well, you know, we've, we've been on the train uh, not that long. Nah, just kidding. <laughs> well, look, we he really we... had to prove himself to you guys. Oh, uh, of course, man. That, that's what it's all about. Every time he fights, he's like, I've got to make some Mish Radio proud. But look, we really appreciate your time, Connor, <laughs> coming on the program, giving us a lot sure. of uh, technical insight. Of course, guys, don't forget, uh, Connor and Patrick Weimer give a lot more technical insight uh, than, you know, just the preview that you got today. Uh, on the fantastic podcast heavy hands by the way when when's the next episode out where can people check it out connor next episode will be out um i'm not sure when this is uh airing but it'll be out on the 20th on september 20th and um that's going to be a a a pretty in-depth technical recap of golovkin versus canelo as well as a look back at rockhold and um as brief a look as we could manage forward at the admittedly very bad ufc japan card but uh (laughs) i promise it's it's not as dry when uh, when i when i do fight analysis with pat so if you check out heavy hands there's somebody else there to break up the long stretches of me talking now we 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 love it really appreciate your time con of course guys don't forget to follow him on twitter at boxing bush that's at boxing b-u-s-h and uh Thank you so much for coming on. What a, what a fantastic submission rated debut. Thanks so much for your time, Connor. Yeah, thanks very much. I appreciate it. Hey, this is Ariel Hawani, and you're listening to Submission Radio with my two favorite mates, Dennis and Casper. All right, guys. Our next guest is an MMA legend, a UFC Hall of Famer. He's the UFC 8 and the UFC Ultimate Ultimate Tournament winner as well as the UFC 10 runner-up. He's also the owner of the most badass mustache in MMA. He now joins us back here on Submission Radio. The man himself, Don Fry. Welcome back to the program. It's an honor to have you. You're damn right it is, boys. What are you doing out there chasing uh, crocodiles or what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When, when, when we're not speaking to you, Don, we're just chasing, you know, crocodiles, koalas, anything that moves, really. Um, just not, just not our girlfriends. Yeah. <laughs> now, Don, yeah, we... I heard, I heard, I heard koalas, koalas taste like chicken, right? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know. Chicken and eucalyptus. I think everything tastes like chicken. <laughs> yeah. Right. right. Now, Don, we've we've always loved you because obviously, you know, you're a character and there's nobody else like you. And a good example that I feel like we should bring up was this week when we contacted you about coming on the show. Do you mind if we read out some of the hilarious conversation that we had? Sure, go ahead. It's all <laughs> so, copyrighted, so you know you'll have to send me a check later on. You'll, you'll, get, you'll get the royalties, I promise. Uh, but I think it's good because sometimes people are like, oh, Don Fry, surely he's not really like that. I think this is the proof, right? And, and Dennis was the one that contacted you asking, you know, Don, are you available for a quick interview tomorrow at 5.30 p.m. LA time? Your response, sure, you fucker. <laughs> so clearly, clearly you knew who it was from the beginning. And then Dennis made the mistake of uh, asking you, actually, could we move it to 5 p.m. 30 minutes earlier? And your response was, no, you Australian cunt. <laughs> you changed it too many times already. <laughs> are these are these the standard Don Fry replies that everybody gets, or are we the only ones lucky enough? Well, you know, I'm trying to uh, be more politically correct in my, in my uh, you know, advanced stage, you know, so I'm softening, you know, I, I'm trying to get a position with uh, President Trump as the uh, ambassador to Australia, you know, so I'm trying to clean up my language a little bit. Uh, well, the reason why that works very well, Don, is I'm not sure if you're aware that, but that the word cunt is actually a term of endearment used amongst friends here in Australia. Did you know about this before sending the text? No, no, no. I know it was, it was a, it meant different in England and in uh, Ireland, you know, but I didn't know, man. I love you in Australia. That's weird. <laughs> does that mean? Does that mean you consider us friends, Don? Is is that why you used it? 
fuck no. Fuck. No. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll tell you what, though. If we send these messages to President Trump, just just one text, one screenshot, and, and you're in his cabinet, guaranteed. He'll love it. He'll love it with language like All that. Right. All right. That's it's why I need. I need a job right now, you know, because I got a lot of bills to pay from this, uh, this uh, divorce. So, you know, a job would be great right on that. So talk to us a little bit about uh, how everything is going in general. Um, last time that we spoke to you, you were recovering from a serious health scare. How are you feeling right now? How's the recovery going? Good. It's uh, just a, it's been almost a year now. So, you know, I'm back to leaving leaving tall buildings in a single bound and out running <laughs> a, you know, a bullet and, uh, you know, pushing a, a locomotive around. So, you know, getting right there, partner. How, how's the back? Because you know, when you when you had that health scare, the broken rod, that was the main culprit. How, how's the back now? Is that one hundred percent? And you, there's no pain anymore. Yeah, back feels great. Back feels. We just need a new shoulder. You know, I woke up from the coma, and my sh- right shoulder hurt like hell. And I figured it's because they had me hog tied when I was in a coma. <laughs> so you know, I must have jerked around and twisted it. But they took a X ray. You know, it's been bothering me since before the Takayama fight, you know, the, the shoulder and the back. And uh, so they took an x-ray and, you know, there's nothing inside there, but, you know, just shadows, you know. <laughs> <laughs> em- empty space, empty space and, and memory, you know. And mustaches. <laughs> That's right. It's, it's like, like where my heart used to be. <laughs> <laughs> The other, the other big thing that came out of our interview last time that we spoke is you mentioned that you had quit drinking. So I'm just wondering, is that still the case, Don? Yeah, yeah. On the 24th, 21st year, a day or two, it'll be one year. Yeah. Wow. Congratulations. Are you, how, how do you celebrate something like that? I think we'll go out and have a couple of drinks. You celebrate. <laughs> <laughs> How else do you celebrate something like that? <laughs> That's- I was going to say the other interesting thing I, I was going to mention when we spoke to Don last time is you mentioned to us that you were going back to school to become a teacher. Uh, have you begun teaching yet? And how's it going? No, that got sidelined with this divorce thing, you know. So. No, every I've been on a holding pattern for you know year and a half, two years now. So all, since all this nonsense started. Yeah. So sorry to hear. Do you think you will go into teaching afterwards? Is that sort of the plan to sort of do that when when this settles down? Well, that depends on if the uh, harassment charges from my ex-wife's boyfriend. Up in Oral Now she's banging a couple of cops up there. So, you know, they're, they're trying to get these fictitious charges on me so they can press her, you know. See, you know, see who can uh, get the most charges against me and impress her. I'm like, you know, you're already in late by her. God dang. You know, all you got to do is throw her 20, you know, and it's right there. So, you know, leave me the hell out of your bullshit. Wow, wow. It, it, it's crazy times. Um, Don, you mentioned how your shoulder was sore when you woke up from that coma and how it's sore right now, but we saw that you recently challenged Mike Tyson to a boxing match for that Mayweather-McGregor undercard. Wondering, how serious were you about that uh, that challenge that you issued? Oh, I was just fishing to see what would happen, you know, but I'm, once I get my shoulder, I'll be 100% serious about it. You know, I, I think it'd be a hell of a hell of a match between Iron Mike Tyson and myself. Did you hear anything about it? Obviously, you were, you were fishing. Did anybody get back to you? Did you hear about, you know, any potential of fighting Mike somewhere down the line? Or did any promoters at least get in touch with you and say, hey, let's let's bring the mustache back? No, no. They must have all thought, you know, it was just a voice from the dead, you know, poking <laughs> around, haunting them, you know. So they didn't hear anything. Speaking of that uh, fight card, the Mayweather-McGregor one, did you watch the boxing match, and what did you think about it? Yeah, I enjoyed it. I thought, I thought McGregor did a hell of a job. You know, I mean, um, Mayweather did a great job carrying him for nine rounds, you know. And, uh, you know, Mayweather, McGregor did a hell of a job, you know, um, Thinking, thinking he was doing it. You know? <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was fantastic all the way around. They both, they both uh, 
play their parts perfectly. What what would you prefer? It sounds like uh, you know not too much belief in Conor McGregor's boxing from your end. Do you want to see him stick around in boxing, or do you want to see him go back to the UFC? No, 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 hell no. The UFC needs him, you know, in the in MMA or else um, Bellator needs him, you know. Um, boxing, yeah, yeah, you know, they they need him, but they're they're not smart enough to. You know, to do it properly, they throw him. They throw him to the wolves right away. You know, they try to get him fight Canelo or Triple G, and then then it'd be over. You know, so they wouldn't be smart enough to give him a couple ham and eggers. <laughs> ham and eggers. Just you before know. we just before we talk about Canelo and Triple G, because we want to ask you about that one as well. Who who would you like to see Conor McGregor fight next? There's a few options. People are talking about this Nate Diaz trilogy. That's the front runner, but people are saying maybe Tony Ferguson, maybe Kevin Lee, maybe even Khabib Nurmagomedov. Anyone that stands out to you, Don? You know, partner, I didn't get to watch the fight. I was watching my buddy Jeff at the stock car races, and um, everybody told me it was a hell of a fight. You know, but boxing being boxing, the judges. Uh, scorecards are questionable, so um, you know I think I'd like to see Diaz. You know, you know I like to see those boys fight again to to see who gets the win. You know, on the on the rubber match, but uh, you know Diaz, hell, he's smart. He just don't give a shit. He's got enough money to live, live the rest of his life, so. Why is he going to screw up his health for it? You know, I mean, the guy, the guy's the only guy with any common sense out there. The interesting thing about uh, the Canelo Triple G fight was done that before the fight happened, Oscar De La Hoya spoke about how the Conor McGregor Mayweather fight was horrible for the sport of boxing. But in a funny twist of, of events, even though you didn't, haven't watched the fight, but y- your buddy would have told you about the terrible decision that came out of it. Do you feel like the decision in the Canelo Triple G fight, in a lot of ways, may hurt boxing a lot more? Because fans are really unhappy with the way that it played out, and it's another case of boxing kind of leaving fans with a bit of taste in their mouth. You know, who the fuck is um, De La Hoya talking about, you know, giving boxing the black guy? The goddamn homo was in garters and stockings and high heels, you know, a <laughs> photograph like that. Who the hell is he to say anything about, you know, embarrassing anything? God damn, that guy embarrassed boxing so bad, you know, he's probably single-handedly uh, responsible for the downfall. Yeah, those, 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 I'm not going to lie, those are some racy pictures of De La Hoya. Don, I wanted to ask you something else, moving away from the boxing world. You mentioned uh, Aki, uh, Takayama before about how your shoulder was hurting even before that fight. And it's kind of crazy because that's obviously one of the fights that you're most known for, you know, the, the insane battle that you guys had back in Pride. But unfortunately, fans and fighters were up, you know, very upset to find out that Takayama had actually suffered a serious injury in a pro wrestling match, and that's seen him paralyzed from the shoulders down. You know, th- there's been a fund to set up to help him in his family which we'll share at the end of the interview but how did you find out the news and, and what was your reaction it broke my heart man it broke my heart and took a piece of my soul you know sakurava son told me backstage there when you know i was privileged enough to induct him into the hall of fame you know ufc hall of fame mm. and he told told me about it then it just you know it it was pretty devastating. Um, it's it's a really sad situation. Have you had a chance to speak uh, to him or his family since the accident? No, partner, I have not. You know, um, I wouldn't know wouldn't know what to say. Mm. Um, so, you know, I wanted to go over there. Almost had the opportunity to go over there October twenty first. And um, corner Scott Norton in a pro wrestling match. And really? Gonna, wow. Yeah, I'm going to take the money from that and drop it off, you know, to him. But that one got got cut because, you know, my ex-wife has got these fictitious charges against me. 
so I can't I can't leave the country. <laughs> oh no, that sucks. Um, just curious, what, yeah. what 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 was Takiyama like out of the ring? Did you guys hang out much before or afterwards? Any any sort of memories you can share with us? You know, I got to meet him afterwards. You know, da- right afterwards. You know, you're downstairs in the locker room, and then you go to get on the bus, and you, you walk down the hallway in, in the arena downstairs, and, you know, it's, it's like a mile walk. And um, we're walking by this room, and he pops out. And he's like, holy balls. You know, and he put it his locker room, and he, and he says, oh, darn, son, I'm, I apologize for not giving you a better fight. <laughs> wow. Hell, you, you, you gave me a better fight, you'd have killed me. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, then we reenacted that, you know, that fight in the movie scene, and then we did a pro wrestling match back in 2013, I think, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, he just, just a great guy, just, a, you know, uh, a fantastic person, you know, and a true professional in every aspect of the word. They say that in, in the pro wrestling business, it's very rare to have any friends, and obviously, you know, it, it is a cutthroat business, kind of like in the fighting business as well. Would you say he was one of the few sort of, you know, guys that you could call a friend in this business? Oh, yeah, you know, him and Scott Norton, um, Brian Johnston. You know, I was real privileged that, you know, Brad Reagans broke me in, you know, um, Kurt Hennig. You know, I was real privileged that I got to meet certain people and, you know, they were part of my life. And uh, it's something, you know, like you said, it's such a cutthroat, nasty business. It's unusual, you know, for something like that to happen. Well, you're lucky just to get one of those, you know, relationships. And, and I got five or six, so I was really, really lucky. For sure. And a lot of the names that you mentioned are legends. Kurt Henning was a guy that a lot of people felt was, you know, one of the best of his time. But he was also known for being a great guy behind the scenes and pulling a few ribs on people. I'm just wondering, from your time around, Kurt, do you have any funny stories from you guys being on the road together or being in Japan or anywhere else together? Oh, man, we got on the airplane in L.A., Kurt and Brad and I, and uh, uh, Kurt, uh, Kurt my, got bought my drink, you know, and I was out. And all the way, I, I mean, for a whole second day in, in Japan, I don't remember, you know, I don't remember the flight, I don't remember landing, I was out, I missed the whole whole day, you know, so I don't know if he, he bought me that heavy or came back, you know, came back around and did, kept doing it a couple of times, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so what did he do? He spiked uh, your drink. Yeah, yeah, just dropped the, dropped the pill in it, uh, you know. Um, I got him back when we were working out in Brad's gym. I filled his rusty boots full of cream cheese. <laughs> and Brian and I, Brian and I were in the ring, you know, working out. <laughs> Kurt, was, you know, pulled his foot out and, and gave me, a, you know, shook his head, gave me a dirty look. He thought he got even. He, he thought he put it back in my boots, but he put it in Brian's boots. So, you know, I got him, man. Then I got Brian. I, you know, and just being, you know, him being in the thick. But then I'll tell you what, Kurt got me a couple of times, man. It's just so embarrassing and stuff. You know, he was great. He was one of those people that, yeah, yeah you're just privileged to, to meet. To, to, to be able to call a guy an acquaintance or a friend, it's it's unbelievable. I'm just, just to spend time with that guy. Yeah. I'm just wondering, why cream cheese? Of all the things you could put in his boots, what gave you the idea to do cream cheese, Don? You know, I had a one of those little silver foils of cream cheese, you know, in my gear bag left over from a flight, you know. And so, and then, well, what the hell else you gonna do with it, you know? <laughs> so, so, there was a boot. There was a boot. There's a package of cream cheese. There's the opportunity. 
Oh, I'll wow. tell you what, that's probably the best thing you could do with that cream cheese. That's an awesome story. <laughs> Before we let you go, Don, because you know you're a busy guy, we wanted to get a couple of thoughts from you on the current situations and landscape of of the UFC and the divisions there. And, and the first of which is, of course, John Jones and the current hot water that he's in due to failing his UFC 214 drug test. What was your take on what the, this can sort of done to his career? Well, I mean, he did it to himself. Unfortunately, you know, he, he did something, he got caught. Not, you know, and not everybody gets caught. But a lot more people do it than don't, I'm sure. And, um, you know, John just greatest fighter, you know, to enter the cage, but he just got a black cloud hanging over his head, man. He just never going to be free of, you know, he got an anchor. He's, he's treading the water. He got a couple anchors on this tied to his ankle, but, you know, it keeps dragging him down. Do you, uh, obviously, it seems like his team are going with the reasoning um, that, or, or the, the story that it might have been a tainted supplement. Do you buy into that? Or, I guess, from, from you know, your perspective, do you think it's sort of as bad as it looks? You know, um, all these drug tests, they catch who they want to catch. So, you know, that being said, there could be tainted, you know what I mean? If they want you to be, be positive, you will be positive, you know? Um, I mean, it's just, he, he's a hell of an athlete to make an example out of, right? Mm. Have you have you seen in your career, Don, uh, you know, drug tests sort of doing that to any other athletes, you know, them looking to, to fail other fighters while keeping a blind eye to others in your career? Have you seen that happen often? Hell yeah, you see that happen all the time. I mean, see it happen in the NFL and baseball, you know. Um, I, mean, I think the only one you don't catch is the NBA because one of the guys said 98% of the guys are smoking pot in the locker room, you know. So that, that, they, they can't test for that. Um, but, hell, you know, it's pro sports. Do you want your do you want your athletes to be better than the average person? You know, I mean, so far that that you, you turn them into gods, or, or do you do you want them to be to look sloppy to look to look like um, big country when he walks in the <laughs> ring? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, I mean, yeah, I, I guess at least big contrast is knockout power. Just before we get off Jones, do you think this could be the end for him? Because he spoke to his coach recently saying he, he, he doesn't know sort of if John would come back if, if he got a four-year suspension. Do you think that might be the end for him? And what do you think this sort of, I, I guess, what, what sort of legacy does this paint for John Jones if we never see him fight again? Well, he'll be back unless he ODs or gets a nasty car record or something. But, you know, he's just not... He's just not, you know, uh, using the stuff before the fight. <laughs> you know, it's part of his life, part of recreational. But, um, you know, that's his business until he runs into somebody who's pregnant, you know. <laughs> um, shit, he just, he may not live long enough to come back in four years. And before we let you go, Don, the other big news was that Ronda Rousey's coach was on the MMA hour, and he said that he wanted to see Ronda have one more fight against Chris Cyborg. Are you surprised that he made that comment, given how Ronda's last two fights ended? Who's who's your coach? Edmund Tarverdian. That's that's Ronda Rousey's coach. Is that that idiot who tried to teach her on the box, but all she did was catch, you know, block punches with her face? That guy's just out for the money, you know. She needs to. She needs to get rid of him and get rid of, you know, ninety percent of the hangers on, and uh, go back to Judo Jean Bell and her mom, and people who were there at the beginning to really care and love for. Her. Otherwise, stay the hell out of the out of the sport because you're just gonna get hurt. We are, I, I was going to say, do you think it's wise, in, in your opinion, for Ronda to just stay retired and not come back, sort of risk another devastating loss, especially considering, you know, it is Cyborg, someone heavier and a more devastating striker than she's ever faced? She has no business being in the ring with Cyborg, you know? 
that would be like like uh, the film the Christmas to the Lion. Uh, you know, it it, 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 <laughs> it would just it, it'd be criminal to let her in there but like, yeah. All right, done. Well, as we let you go, we we want we see one of your latest movies is in post production. Animal Among Us, a new horror movie that I know a lot of people are excited about is in post production and looking to be released soon. So as we wrap up, are there any other projects coming out you'd like your fans to keep an eye out for, you know, this year, early next year? Yeah, I did another one last year with uh, Sean Stone, Oliver Stone's son, and mm. Alex Rafe. Uh, you know, they were the writer, co-directors, and can't remember the name of it. It's <laughs> some whatever the uh, Stone's character's name is, um, and the Golden Fleece, something in the Golden Fleece, you know. And but it's a hell of a funny movie, man. Um, has so many people. Into into the fist in and the golden fleece. Yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. Yeah, you know, Sean Stone plays a guy named Fist, <laughs> and it's just, it's just a silly movie. And like I said, there's so many cameos. Bill Goldberg and I did a fight scene in a car wash you know, for <laughs> we for about a half an hour. You know, we did this, and um, you know, I don't know how much of it's going to make the film, but. Man, it was funny. My back, you know, I had the broken rod in my back, and it hurt like hell. But I was having so much fun, I couldn't stop. You know? but boy, I was laid up for a couple of days afterwards. <laughs> I tell you that. Wow, there you go. Well, look, hopefully, hopefully there are more fun times like that. You know, you and Bill Goldberg, or you and any other movies. Enter the Fist and the Golden Fleece. That's the movie that Don's talking about. There's also a whole bunch of other ones. Chuck Hank and the San Diego Twins, Animal Among Us. Yeah, and, that was a good one. Yeah, and there's also Glacial yeah. Tongue. That's the war movie as well. That's still coming out. That's coming out next year. So there's a lot of fun things to check out with Don Fry. And of course, follow him on Twitter at Don Fry Fighter. And don't forget to donate for Yoshihiro Takayama by going to all-japan.co.jp slash Takayama underscore info. I wish they made the website a little bit easier, but obviously you can go there, donate to him, his cause, and his family. He's a man that really needs it. And as always, Don, we really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. Always a lot of fun, and uh, thank you so much for talking with us today. Yeah, guys. You know, since I can almost sound so much, because God bless him, he's the hell of a guy. Mm. He really is. And just get dealt a bad hand. So help the man out, please. Thank you, guys. Take care. Hey, this is Jimmy Manuel. You listen to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest is one of the realest fighters there is and a true warrior. He continues the Easy Money Tour and takes on Stephen Wonderboy Thompson at UFC 217 at Madison Square Garden on November 4th. He is Jorge Gamebred Masvidal. Jorge, welcome back to Submission Radio. How are you? What's up, my Australian brothers? How you guys doing, man? Yeah, good, good. It's good to have you on the show, Jorge, and thanks so much for taking the time to chat with us. Before we even talk about fighting, we want to ask you, what have the last few weeks been like for you with Hurricane Irma and everything that's going on in Florida? Oh, man, it's been some serious shit. I still ain't got no power, bro. Wow. I'm going to get home, and I got to take one of them, the water, huh? water, please. Water? I got to take one of those uh in the black darkness shadow showers you know and, and everything i'm getting done at nighttime is like that you know i got a flashlight and stuff but it's it's a problem man you know but we used to it out here it's nothing crazy you know uh my my mango tree that gave me mangoes every year like 60 to 100 mangoes every year mm. got root, ripped from the roots like it twisted it over you know so it wasn't uh, the best of things and then there's two more hurricanes in the atlantic right now so it ain't over for us yet Wow, that's terrible. I feel like the mango one, the mango tree being gone, that's probably that's probably the worst part about it. How how are you sort of dealing with it, especially considering that, you know, you've got a really important fight coming up, UFC 217, and, you know, you, you're taking showers in the dark. Man, it's it's been a headache. I should have the power, hopefully, tomorrow morning. You know, the, the, the bad thing is that I have power for like a day, mm. then I didn't have power for two days, and then I have power for two days, and then today I woke up with no power. Yeah. So last night I made the mistake of buying groceries, and now most of them probably have gone bad. You know, I mean, I moved the important stuff to like another fridge, somebody else's house, but it's just, it's a, it's a headache, you know? Uh, but mm. man, that shit don't crazy me, man. I had to drive 18 hours to get my family out of here and I drove them straight. And then I had to drive another 18 hours straight to get them back. And 
Whoa. It's what you do when you're a man, you know, you get shit done. Mm. Uh, talk to us a little bit about the ATT gym. Is everything okay there, or has there been some structural damage to the gym? No, if you've seen that gym, there's no structural damage that couldn't be done to that gym. You need like an earthquake of mass proportions to hit, and <laughs> earthquakes can hit Florida. Actually, uh, that was a bunker for a lot of fighters. Um, they had 30 to 40 plus people there as, as shelter because the, the building is not going anywhere. You know, it's one of those concrete, maybe two feet of concrete slabs everywhere. You know, it, it, it's a great facility to be in for any type of catastrophe. Mm, it's like the fighters are strong and, and the gym is strong. There's a lot of, uh, there's, there's signs that you're just curious before we get off the hurricane topic, where, where were you for the, you know, for, for the sort of worst parts of Irma? Were you using the gym as a bunker as well? Or did you sort of stand tight at, at home? Uh, no, I, I took off to Tennessee because, um, I got a, I got a two year old man. I got, I got three kids in total. You know, my wife, it just wasn't, uh, if it was just me, I would have stayed here, man. I had plenty of places I could have gone to, but since it was so bad, I didn't know how long we wouldn't have power or streets would be flooded. I just decided to take off the things got better, you know? So I got back to Florida like last week, like on a Thursday. Wow. Yeah, and it's crazy. And obviously, a lot of fighters, there are a lot of teammates affected like Tiago Alves. So it's good to see that um, your family was safe and, and that hopefully you have some power soon. Let's go back a few months to UFC 211 where you had a razor-close loss to Damian Meyer. Given how that fight was close and that you were on the cusp of a title shot, how tough was that loss to deal with? And mentally, how did you go about moving forward from that? Man, mentally it wrecked me, you know, because I, I since I since I started striking – or training, I, I could tell that that was my gift. A guy gave me, he said, here, I'm going to give you speed and reflexes and you do the rest. And uh, and I've always prepared myself to be able to use those tools by not having nobody hold me down. I got close to 40 fights. Nobody's ever held me down for for half that time or even a minute. In, in UFC, I had never been held down. So obviously, I just had to get back to the drawing board, see the mistakes I did so I don't make them again. So um, a lot of people feel I won that fight because of the damage. And uh, he did a lot of the control, so you could say he wanted to. But that that's the only loss that hurts me, that bothers me, that every night I don't go to sleep how I used to sleep because all I'm thinking about is ending this motherfucker's life at one point. Not that I'm going uh, to do something outside the ring. Just when, when we fight again, I'm going to do everything I can to dismantle him, you know? Wow, wow. So that's that's obviously a rematch that you... Do you sort of feel like you can't really end your career without facing Damian Maia again? No, I cannot end my career without facing him. Mm. There's no... There's no way, no how. It it, it won't happen. It, it won't go down like that in history. You know, I, I made a couple of early mistakes that uh that costed me uh, several bad positions, you know, and I just didn't fix that one mistake. So if I could keep it, you know, obviously, if I could keep it a little bit longer, you know, instead of two minutes and a half, some of those runs were three minutes and a half that we were on the feet. If I could keep it just a little bit more, and I'm only talking about a minute more, I could have broken them. I could have... I could have stopped him, you know. The, the legs were devastated. I seen him after. He was limping around. So I, I, I know that, that uh, I was on the right plan with my offensive attack. I just need my defense and, and certain things that uh, that I got caught up in just to be a little sharper that night. And we know how much this title shot meant to you. Was it tough watching Maya get the shot and not really be able to do much with it against Tyron at UFC 214? I, I knew against Tyron he'd have a problem. Tyron's a, a stronger dude than him. And he has a way better wrestling base. And if I would have hit the ground, it could have been a huge problem, you know. But I was really surprised in that uh, Damien didn't drop half guard. And that, that's really where he's at, you know. He, his wrestling is not the best. His wrestling is really not good. But his half guard makes him a threat from another planet, you know. Something that, that uh, I've experienced a lot. I've been in, in practice millions of times with guys with good half guard. Nothing close to Damien. Damien really has a world-class half guard. I was surprised that he didn't drop. To, to half guard and, and at least try to open up that avenue. Mm -hmm. And Tyron obviously did a phenomenal job of stuffing all those takedowns and, and not letting Damon get the fight where he wanted. What did you think about the criticism, though, afterwards that Tyron received after the Maya fight? Do you think maybe people didn't really appreciate how hard it is dealing with Maya's style? Uh, you know, I, when I first saw the performance, I was like, man, he did pretty damn good. And then I started seeing the internet and stuff. And yeah. He maybe could have opened up more, but seeing that he had the shoulder injury, mm. you know, that that's something. And, and with a guy like Maya, you want to open up because, man, he sucks on the feet, you know. And and maybe he doesn't like to hear it, but it's the fucking honest truth. He sucks on the feet, you know. He doesn't really know what's going on there. But he's so good at this one thing, then he can 
null and void everything you do. He could take you down and just keep you there because his threat of submission is so dangerous that you might not even think to get away. You're thinking, first, let me not get choked out or get my face cracked from his, his insane grip. So you're just worried about defense. And when you're thinking about defense, you're not moving. You're not you're not creating scrambles. Mm-hmm. So I, think, yeah, look- I think Tyrone, to tell you the truth, did, did a great job. Was it the most exciting fight in the world? No, but, you know, sometimes you got to just beat a guy up thoroughly, you know? Mm. Mm. And and you were calling out Stephen Thompson for ages after the Maya fight, and it took a while to finally get booked. How do you feel about finally having that locked in, and why did you want this fight so much? What stood out about it to you? Well, the number one thing is he's the number one contender. He had the draw with the champion and then the decision with the champion that a lot of people felt could have gone the other way. So in, in fighting him, destroying a guy like that, you're only moving forward, you know? There's other options that came up to me, but I'm like, nah, man, I want I want – the toughest, best guy I could possibly get my hands on, I'm not taking a step back, you know? And uh, I'm glad I got Thompson, you know? And, and plus, this is something that the sport needs. There's been a lot of weak sauce decisions that people don't want to see ever again, you know? We, we're going to bring action, you know? He's got his style and I got mine, and, and it just spells for, for action, for trouble. Mm, I've, I've heard you say that you you expect violence in this fight. Well, what do you see as your advantages over him, Jorge? And how do you sort of avoid a technical stalemate like in you know some of the other fights? Well, that's one thing, you know. Thompson could get on his bike, and, and it's hard to catch him if he wants to be that guy that night. It could be tough, you know. But I got I got several tricks up my sleeve. At the end of the day, man, I'm, I'm a fighter. I'm not a striker. I'm not a grappler. I'm just, I could fight, you know. I'm going to take the fight. Every aspect of fighting, I'm going to bring it to him at some point or another, you know? So he's going to have to fight, you know? If he chooses it on the feet, he, he wants to play defensive, well, I'm just going to have to get in, in, in his face and do other things that will make him open up, you know? Mm. As someone with amazing striking yourself, how do you rate his striking style? How good do you think his karate uh, hybrid striking style is in MMA? Well, definitely his, his karate, I would say, top notch. I've seen a lot of guys karate and it's, and it's not the best. This guy has seriously polished up his tools, you know. There, there's little things. It's just the little things that make the difference between where he's at now and some guys that had a regional show that can't make that bridge. And that's little things that he does, you know. Um, in, in, in his way of doing karate, it's karate, but it's not pure karate. He has a little twist and turns on everything that he does and the way he chambers his kicks and, and he keeps his uh, offense going. But you're going to see that when he gets in there with another polished striker like myself, it's not going to take a step back. It's not going to pity pat with him and try to go to, to a point fighting match. It's going to get ugly real quick because he's going to have to fight in all the ranges. And I can fight in all the ranges. I can fight in the pocket. I can fight chest to chest. I can fight in the outside. I could pick him up and put him on his head and make his life hell for 15 minutes. So he's going to have to fight, man. You know, he could do whatever the fuck he wants to do. And, and I'm really never concerned myself with people's strategies. I just know that I'm going to get all up in that ass, man. I'm going I'm to hurt this dude. <laughs> All up in that ass. I love it. Will you? Will you be given that? You know, your your teammate Tyron Woodley's fought him a couple of times. Will you be getting Tyron to be a big part of you know your preparation for this fight? I mean, I'm not gonna bug him and like pick his brain or nothing. But I see the fights that he had, you know, and and pick up little tricks and things that he did there that worked for him. I know, I know what Thompson does. You know, he, I, I know exactly in and out what Thompson does. Before I was ever gonna fight him, I had seen him fight. I think we were on the same card, and I saw him fight live, and I was like, oh man, he has an interesting different style that he brings to the game you know what i mean uh, on a technical level he does so many things wrong but he gets away with it because of of not of his athleticism because i don't think he's the best best athlete i think it's because of, of the way he sets things up you know he's able to get away with with these big mistakes that he's not going to be able to do with me you know he does a lot of funky stuff that uh that guys really are, are just backpedaling on him you know they're not putting the pressure on him they're not fighting him mm-hmm Talk to us a little bit about this hashtag you've got going lately, hashtag ho slap season. Where did this come from and what does it mean? Uh, what it means exactly is hoes are getting slapped, man. <laughs> I'm not talking about the female ones. I'm not talking about the female ones. As the all the princesses out there in the world, I love them. I'm not I'm not slapping no women. It's just certain dudes are getting slapped up, man. Especially the ones that be acting like hoes. Who, who who are the hoes and who are acting like hoes? Oh, man, I don't think we got enough time in this interview to go over that. <laughs> that many? But there's, in, in my sport, in my sport, there's a lot, man. You know, there's a lot of them. I'll tell you one of them, that uh, bitch being Michael, Michael, whatever the, the count, 
you know, he's a little bitch. He needs to get slapped up, man. He needs to fucking uh, man up for the shit that he did, you know, ripping my country's flag for no reason. Then saying corny ass shit like, hey, the flag was just happened to be there. My ass, you put that shit in your pocket and you probably brought it in. He's such a corny dude, you know. He does corny things like that, like to another man that just finished fighting. You know that nothing can happen. There's more security in there than, than in the White House, and you acting crazy like that. You know, that's not man shit. You know, if I would respect him if he did that, like, on the on, on the solo, like, in front of Joel or in front of me or anybody that reps that country and, and, and did things like that, you know. And, I mean, he's just a home man since even before that, spitting on people's corners. What, who are you? You know, what, 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 why would you do that? You know, maybe in England, spitting on people is, like, acceptable. I don't know. But here in America, you get killed for shit like that, you know. You don't spit on people, especially people's corners. I just think that's that's the number one hole I gotta slap, man. If God is 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 with me and I and I get the get this title, I'm gonna break that dude's face one way or another, you know? I just I gotta get in there and, and show the world what a hole he is. It sounds like you wanna fight him. I'm just wondering, are you expecting any tense moments oh, or, 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 or run ins between because you oh, guys man, I would, it, I, I would I, I'm not gonna say I'd do it for free because you never do nothing you're good at for free. Hmm. But I would fight that guy for like fucking I don't know, take me to McDonald's and let me pick out and I'm fighting that guy, you know, just buy me a fucking dinner and I'll break that guy's face, you know? Mm-hmm. Are you expecting any sort of, you know, tense moments or run-ins? Because you guys are fighting on the same card, UFC 217. You're probably going to be spending, you know, a fair bit of time together doing media and around the hotel and things like that. Are you expecting any tense moments? I'm just expecting his titty fits, you know? That dude is is a child, you know? i seen him at... Uh, Seen him in Vegas. The first time I seen him actually ever in my life, and it was after he set up all types of, of craziness on social media and, and you know, telling me something if you ever saw me. So we happen to be walking. I happen to be walking out of my uh, hotel elevator, and he's getting out of the cab, stumbling drunk. And this is like eight in the morning, and I see him, and I just start staring at him. And we were in the same line of path trajectory. He went completely to the other side, and just not focused on me. Not didn't look at me none. I'm looking at him, and I go. Bisping, what's up? You know, to, and I raise my hands up to see what 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 his thought process is, what it, what he's thinking. You know, and the whole UFC PR was in. They were dying laughing because he threw up like the cowabunga sign, just walked away and got in the elevator. And since then, I knew he was a little hole. You know, uh, I already knew before, but that like extra clarified it for me. So I'm, I'm sure he's gonna try to get at me in New York or something. But he knows who I am, and I know who he is, man. He he he's just gonna do craziness when the cameras is around. But if it's just me and that guy. Like, let's say we're in a parking lot, and he was trying to take my parking spot, it wouldn't happen, you know? Wow. And you got to sh- tell us your thoughts on this matchup against GSP, because a lot of fighters are frustrated about the fact that GSP has moved up to Millowad and is getting the shot against Bisping, and that Bisping is fighting him. Are you, are you a fan of this matchup? Uh, man, I'm a fan of, of super huge fights, right? Mm-hmm. So maybe I'm not the biggest fan of this match stylistically, because I, I really don't care, but... It's a big fight for the sport, you know. I hope it brings in new faces, new people that have never seen the the the, the UFC, maybe or even old fans of GSP that that haven't been watching as much. I just hope it gets it breaks all record pay per view and, and crazy shit like that. You know, that, that's what I hope for. But uh, I really don't care for it. You know. Do you do you, I'm just curious. Do you think GSP can beat him? And are you sort of going to be going for GSP given you know this rivalry with Bisping? Here's the thing, and and I don't want people like to clickbait me and say that I'm saying GSP's on drugs. Cause that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying though is, I don't know if that motherfucker is gonna do well after Usada. You know, I don't know if if Usada has affected him or not. So we're gonna see. So I would never bet on a horse that's that hasn't been under the conditions of Usada because he's been out doing whatever the hell he wanted. And maybe he was juicy, maybe he wasn't. But we're gonna find out November fourth. Mm-hmm. What's your what do you think is the reasoning behind GSP wanting to fight Bisping so badly and moving up to middleweight rather than? Fighting in welterweight against possibly a Tyron Woodley. Because Bisping's a bitch, man. That's the easiest money on the fucking UFC roster. If you near that guy's weight, we all want to fight that guy, man. All fighters think think that, that man, if I could pick anybody in the roster to just fight and, and guarantee my money, it's Bisping, man. Of course he wants to fight Bisping, man. He got his ass kicked by Dan Henderson. Dan Henderson is a legend, one of my favorite fighters. But, oh, man, the dude's way past his prime, man. He was, like, how old was he, 45 years old? Uh, uh, Dan Henderson in shape or even a uh, uh, Dan in the beginning, the decision Dan? Do you guys remember that guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the day before he started knocking people out, he was just taking everybody down and smother. Mm-hmm. That guy would have killed Bisping, too. 
And uh, it's just crazy that he had to fight Dan Henderson at 45, and he still got his ass kicked. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And he's not even a man about it. Like, yeah, I lost this fight, whatever. He's a little bitch about it. We're just moving on from GSP and Bisping and going back to your fight, Jorge. Where, where does Wonderboy fit into the, the host lap season? Is, is he a hoe or is he not on the hoe list? No, he's a cool dude, bro. I met, I met him like three years ago, and uh, he just was like super polite, came up to me, said hello for no reason. You know, like, hey, how you doing? I'm Stephen Thompson. I was like, hey, how you doing, bro? And then uh, he was just like that with everybody. You know, he's a cool dude, man. He's not, he's not starting no drama or pretending to be somebody he's not. Just to sell some tickets or to get a Facebook like, he really is that that cool dude that you see on TV. It's just a nice guy all the time, you know. Mm-hmm. And we've had some wonderful experiences with him as well, and a lot of fans have told us he's like that to them as well. But with no clear next contender in the welterweight division currently, Jorge, what do you think a win over Thompson does for you? Obviously, you mentioned how he's ranked right up there, but do you think it puts you as the front runner for the next title shot? Damn right. I mean, that's number one. Draw with the champion. Those are just facts, you know, like there, there's nobody closer to the title than, than Thompson. Like if, uh, man, fucking Woodley vacated the title or something, Thompson and, and, and me would be the guys fighting for the title because Thompson's the, the highest ranked dude you could think of, you know? Mm, I'll, I have to ask, what about Robbie Lawler? Because he's currently number one. Do you feel like if you beat Stephen Boy Thompson, that puts you up there and ahead of Robbie Lawler as well? I, I would think so, man. You know, he's an ex-champion, so he has a different... A different, uh, a different route to the title. You know, I'm, I'm sure if you beat Sosanos now for the title, it's gonna be, uh, it's gonna be a mix-up. It's gonna be up in there. You know, but the only thing that I got on my side is that, um, the fight ended in round one, the, the, the Woodley and Robbie fight. You know, so I think people would just maybe want to see a fresh guy in the Wood Woodley that hasn't fought. Mm-hmm. And you know, people are really excited about the matchup. Has anyone in the UFC confirmed that if you win, you'll get the next title shot? And have, have they been speaking to you at all, Jorge? No, not at all, man. Nobody's told me shit. Do you sort of feel like, because, you know, Thompson's fought twice, do you sort of feel like, once again, the UFC are calling on Jorge Masvidal to, you know, maybe take out a guy that maybe they don't want to see in the title picture anymore? Kind of like, you know, with Maya. Oh, for sure. Don't nobody want to see a Woodley Thompson 3. It's just, it's, it just doesn't create action, you know? Like, sustained action, because they do have moments of, of, of fucking war, but... People want to see war every second of every minute, so you got to get as close to that as you can. Do you have any concern that after this best being fired, GSP drops down and tries to jump in, in front of the line for the next title shot against Woodley? I wish. I would I would love to sh- shut his mouth, like, wired shut for six months, so I, I hope he comes to the welterweight. Now, I, I don't think he should get another free pass because he already jumped the whole 85 line. Why should you get another pass at 170? You know, mm. so it's I, I I don't I don't I don't see that happening. But you never know with the UFC. Maybe it happens, maybe it doesn't. But as long as I get my my fair chance to bust that guy up, I would love it. You know, mm, of course. And just while we're talking, obviously about the division, what do you think about RDA? He sort of made a bit of a splash. Are you impressed with his run so far at 170? And you know, do you think he's a guy that you know, of course, after you would soon be uh, you know campaigning for that title, maybe in the running? I'm gonna say. Um, Straight, honestly, from my heart, at 55, I, I was very impressed with a lot of guys he beat and the way that he beat them. Mm. At 70, I haven't, I didn't see uh, the Magni fight, but Magni's nobody to brag about. That, that's why I wanted to get my hands on that dude, because that's, that's number two after Biz being the easiest fight. And Tarek Safadine, I think you saw us hurt that guy a lot, you know. So at welterweight, though he's looking good, uh, what's his face? I don't, I don't think he's, he's gotten like a real test yet at 170. You know, I think he's going to get the real test in Robbie right now. That's going to be the the breaking ground. If he could beat Robbie, then then he's a problem, you know? Well, we're talking about all these big money fights, Jorge. The last time that we spoke to you, you told us about how you were frustrated at one point with your career in MMA and almost went over to boxing. And now it kind of looks like things are going a lot better for you. Obviously, you're very close to a title. But with the whole McGregor-Mayweather fight uh, happening and a lot of you know MMA fighters getting their boxing licenses and looking to box even Gabriel Gonzaga looks like he's going to have a boxing match is boxing still a goal at all for you that you'd like to entertain or have you sort of put it on hold for now until you become the UFC champion funny that you ask me with these people we might be able to materialize that fight at some point oh sorry you, you, you cut out there what did you say Triple G's people contacted you no we we, uh, we contacted might be a fight in the future, me against Triple G, you know, and I know people are going to pay 
the last dollar on their bill on the wallet to watch that fight. Everybody's going to tune in that one. Wow. When when did you guys hit him up? Was this after the Canelo fight or a little bit earlier? <laughs> nah, that's just a rumor, but you spread it, though, okay? Let's see if it picks <laughs> up any fire and I get the fight, man. <laughs> All right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll send that we're out gonna there. Do, ha- we're going to do some hood tactics. We're going to do some hood tactics on the world. Masvidal versus Triple G. How, how, how would you beat Triple G? How do you see that fight going? Let's get people excited, Jorge. Man, I, I'm a fan of Triple G. That guy just goes to work. You know, he puts on his hard hat and goes to work. Those are the fighters I like to see. I would love to fight that dude, man. It'd be awesome. He's yeah. another he's another guy that seems like a great guy behind the scenes of, as well. But, okay, before we wrap up, and there's a lot of exciting things happening in Jorge Masvidal's career, we've got to talk about the fact that your next fight will be at the historical Madison Square Garden. Me and Casper spent some time there uh, when the UFC made their debut up there. It's pretty crazy up there. It's it's a huge, uh, I suppose it's a huge moment in an athlete's career when they whenever they can perform in a, in a place like Madison Square Garden that holds so much history, holds so many uh, big fights. What does it feel like for you knowing that UFC uh, uh, that you'll be stepping in there against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson? And does it make it any extra special for you that you kind of at that point in your career where you're so close to a title shot and also fighting in one of the biggest, most iconic arenas of all time? Definitely. Since uh, since I started my career, there was a couple places, a couple arenas I wanted to fight in. I, I had wrote them down. And um, this is one of my top five arenas that I want to fight in. Actually, like, number two. My, my first at the time was um, St. Thomas Arena in Japan, which I got to fight in. Madison Square Garden was always... Before my career was done, I'd do it, you know, um, especially for the fact that my, my favorite fighter of all time won his first world title at lightweight there. And he also fought a couple other times, there, but he's just one of my favorite fighters of all time. Plus, all, all the Latin fighters that got to fight there, like Trinidad, I think Oscar De La Hoya also fought there. You know, so it's just Sugar Ray Leonard. It's just an iconic place for, for fighting. Not I don't care about what actress performed there or or whatever the hell about anything. I just care about the the blood, guts, and, and, and tears that boxing has brought in there. Ali Frazier, number one, was in there. I mean, what the fuck, mm. right? Like, that, mm. that's fucking mind-blowing, man. It's insane. And I feel like it's an inspirational story, you know, from you, Jorge, because you obviously started fighting in the streets, you were in these makeshift rings, and now you're fighting in the world's most famous arena. So it's it's amazing to sort of, you know, that significance of how far you've come, and, you know, here, here you are fighting Stephen Thompson, UFC 217. As we let you go, last question we promise, what is the official prediction? How, how yeah, do you see man. yourself beating him? Oh, yeah, man. I'm still fighting in these streets, so, bro. <laughs> Every day. What do, you, what, do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, many things, man. Sometimes, you know, somebody gets fresh. I got to pop pop, you know, put them in check. And just find in the streets anyways, man. The, the streets are me. I'm a, I live, you know, what, what I do, the people I'm with, that's still a part of me, man. It hasn't, it hasn't left, and that's why you see it every time I step into the ring, you know. That's who I am. Well, speaking of the next time you are stepping on the ring, Jorge, give us the prediction. As we let you go, how do you see yourself beating Stephen Thompson at UFC 217 on November 4th? I stop him in bad. Like people feel like how people feel bad for Cowboy like that, similar to that route. Like, man, you just feel bad for Wonderboy and you're like, hey, you know what? Maybe that was unfair of the commission to make that fight happen. Well, there you go, guys. Jorge Masvidal looking to make a massive example in a statement against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, UFC 217. It goes down November 4th at the iconic Madison Square Garden in New York. And, of course, here in Australia, November 5th because of the time difference. Go on and get an Easy Money T-shirt. You can get them uh, from Jorge Masvidal. The, the information is on his Twitter. Maybe there'll be a host lap season T-shirt. I don't know. I'm just looking to the future. And, of course, follow him on Twitter and Instagram, at GameBreadFighter. Jorge, really appreciate the time, really. You are the realest guy. We love chatting with you. So thank you so much. And we hope the power, we hope the power comes back for you. I'm hoping too, man. I'm tired of man, Miami's the most humid place. I don't know how Australia is, but I'm about to find that. Actually, I forgot to tell you guys. Even bigger news than my fight. After my fight, I'm going to Australia. I'm already confirmed. I'm gonna be out there for that UFC show. So I'll be running into you guys soon enough, man. And all my Australian fans and brothers out there, I can't wait. No way. And j- just quickly, do you reckon you'll maybe do some seminars or something, something for the Aussie fans? Oh, for sure, man. What, whatever is asked of me, I, I'll do it. You know, I uh, I love the travel and just. Embrace cultures, you know, and just eat as much as Australian food as I can and, and, and just have a good time. Awesome. Well, look, we'll show you a good time when you're here. Good luck in the fight, and uh, we'll definitely see you in Australia next year. Thank you, my brothers. No, this year, man. 
Oh, this year, this year. Yeah, November, November, November. Sorry. We'll see you in a few months then. Yeah. Yes, sir. You guys have a good night, man. Take care. Bye. Hey, guys. This is Brian Stan. You're listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys. Our next guest is a very special member of the Submission Radio 2016 Buffet Squad. The squad hasn't come back together, but there's been multiple chats on Submission Radio breaking down the crazy world of MMA. I'm, of course, talking about the legend himself, the man behind Nerdcore Movement, who has uh, such fans as Seth Rogen and many others, and, of course, his amazing work with Flow Combat and MMA Weekly, the man behind the Fight Society podcast, one of the best podcasts in the game. Damon Mann, welcome back to Submission Radio. Thank you for having me as always. I appreciate it. Really appreciate you coming back on the show, man. We always love having you. Now, before we talk MMA, we, before we talk about some of the big news, it wasn't that long ago that we were talking about your move from foxsports.com after the website obviously decided to get rid of a lot of the written work. And uh, obviously now you're doing phenomenal work at Flow Combat and MMA Weekly. But we saw this and found it interesting because uh, there is a report saying that foxsports.com has reportedly lost 88% of its audience after pivoting to video and apparently the traffic has gone from 143 million in a monthly period to just under 17 million i mean i, th- I think it pretty much is very clear how much damon martin really brought to the product and uh <laughs> when you don't have damon you don't really have anything but just curious what do you think about that are you surprised did you think that w- this was going to happen what do you make of it you know honestly the the best way i can describe it is disappointing because i worked at fox for almost four years I put a lot into that website and a lot into, uh, you know, helping to grow the, the UFC section. You know, when I came on board, they were still kind of growing the UFC section. And then I, I kind of I was kind of the kind of the, the 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 anchor, so to speak, of that, because, you know, they had some changeovers in editorial and some changeovers in editors and things like that. And I was kind of the one constant with the UFC page. And, uh, you know, it just kind of bums me out that we built a, you know, really viable section and we had a great a great section for, you know, interviews and news stories and kind of fun buzzworthy stories and videos. And we just kind of a little bit of everything. And, uh, you know, this kind of bums me out to see that it's gone that far. I mean, uh, you know, listen, I don't work there anymore. So, uh, you know, I don't have any loyalty to them at this point. So I'm not surprised, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, as soon as it happened, and this was just from an outsider looking in, uh, no one seemed to be that jazzed about only video. Um, while people do consume a lot of video content, uh, I think people still want to read. They still want to get news in a in a written format, uh, just like anything else. When news breaks, you know, it's 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 a it's a written article that you typically read about something like that mm-hmm. happening. So um, I, I had a feeling that was I had a feeling the traffic was going to drop pretty dramatically. I mean, you know, basically just rehashing television article television st- television clips on video on a website doesn't really seem that attractive to me. Uh, and it seems like the audience is, uh, is proving that to be true. Mm-hmm. And while we're still on Fox, uh, Damon, a lot of people wondering at the moment, and this is a little segue to MMA, but what's the deal with the UFC and their deal with Fox? I mean, at the moment, it looks like, and I believe you, you, you spoke about this on Twitter, there's a couple of weeks left until the UFC um, can start, I suppose, negotiating with other, uh, with other networks about being, you know, the the sole s- sort of uh, provider of UFC. What what do you sort of know about the situation? And do you think they will re-sign with Fox, or do you think there's a real possibility UFC goes somewhere else? Well, they have two weeks of exclusive uh, negotiation period left. The negotiating period was three months from July through September with only Fox. After September expires, then the UFC can begin fielding offers from other outlets, whether we're talking about you know networks, streaming offers, whatever the case may be, they can start fielding other offers. Their Fox deal isn't up until the end of 2018, so they still have another year left on the deal, but then at that point they would move to a different network or re-up with Fox. Um, as far as I know, I mean, I assume Fox wants to keep them because of how much content the UFC provides for Fox and for FS1. But at the same time, I also know the UFC is asking for a pretty hefty increase from their current contract, which is about $115 million a year. Uh, they're looking for, you know, somewhere to between three and four times that as much. How much Fox is willing to spend in this particular atmosphere where rights fees are kind of astronomical and the return on the investment isn't what it once was with ratings going down and you know the overall television landscape changing so dramatically with so many streaming people coming on board i mean just this year amazon you know bought a package to showcase the nfl on thursday nights and they're sharing that with another network but 
you know, Amazon and last year it was Twitter getting involved shows you that streaming services are going to be players in the online or in the, in the live sports market. So it will be interesting to see how it plays out. You know, from my understanding is the UFC and Fox aren't any closer to coming to a deal within these next two weeks. Now, of course, that could change. Uh, so I don't expect them to re-up within these next two weeks. And I think the UFC will start fielding other offers. Uh, there's still a chance that Fox could come in and decide to keep him. Uh, I think they're going to wait and see what other people are willing to offer the UFC. If somebody comes in and says, hey, we'll pay you $300 million, and that's the most they can get, maybe Fox could come back and say, we'll offer you $325 million, and then they get it at a considerable discount from what you know WME, IMG wants for it. Uh, but right now, I would say there are about three or four major players that are interested in the UFC, Fox being one. Uh, I think I think uh, NBC is another possibility. I think Amazon mm. is a possibility. I think Amazon streaming service is a big possibility. They're adding live sports. And uh, Jeff Bezos, the owner, the CEO of Amazon, has money to burn. Um, I think they're a viable candidate. And I think Turner is a viable candidate with TNT and TBS and their network system because, you know, they don't really have a dedicated uh, sports channel necessarily, but they do have a lot of networks that could spread around for the UFC if they did get the UFC. So I think those are the four major players, uh, but that doesn't mean somebody couldn't come in at the 12th hour and, and make a bid. What about ESPN and Showtime? Are they completely out of the running? Because ESPN, obviously, you know, massive dedicated sports channel. I think, I, I, I correct me if I'm wrong, but the biggest in America. And then, of course, you got Showtime. There were a few rumors floating around that hey maybe showtime would be interested any truth to that well espn i would say is a long shot i mean anything is possible they're engaged in a pretty brutal pr war with fox right now and i think espn swooping in and stealing away the ufc would be a big deal but the problem is and what i know for a fact is, is that espn is really in a cost-cutting mode in terms of not spending a lot of money on owner on uh, viewership rights mm. uh you know they've gotten they've got a lot of rights deals to run through like 2021 and 2022 that are very, very expensive. And I know that, you know, with them losing subscribers and things like that, that uh, it's going to be a tough sell for ESPN to get on board. And they just did that deal with Top Rank Boxing recently where they're going to get more boxing matches on there. I just have a hard time believing they're going to make a big investment of, you know, three or $400 million a year uh, to, to have, you know, the UFC. As far as Showtime goes, you know, I know Steven Espinosa made those comments uh, on the MMA Hour a couple weeks ago that they'd be crazy not to get involved. But And I'm, this is not a knock on Steven Espinosa. I'm not saying that uh, the guy doesn't have some power in the decision-making. But ultimately, that decision is going to uh, lie with a guy by the name of Les Moonves, who is the CEO of CBS, because CBS owns Showtime. Uh, and ultimately, if they're going to do a rights package, you know, CBS is going to be involved in some way, shape, or form, especially with that kind of money being tossed around. So I don't think so. From the last I heard, CBS had no interest in making a bid for the UFC. Uh, they already have NFL. They have college basketball. Uh, they have college football. You know, they have a lot of you know a big a big package of uh, programming already that I don't know that they're really that interested in, in ES or the, in the UFC. The only reason they may get involved is because they have the CBS Sports Network, which they're trying to grow. I know there's been a couple of smaller MMA shows that were on CBS Sports Network, but even that, I have a hard time believing the UFC would jump at that because it would almost feel like a step down because CBS Sports Network doesn't have nearly the viewership mm. that FS1 has, and unless they're guaranteed to get shows on CBS and Showtime, I think it'd be a harder sell for the UFC to kind of take a downgrade in networks uh, to go there, especially if that's where, you know, 80% of their, their programming is going to go. Mm -hmm. Intended broadcasting should definitely get the UFC. They could call it UFC Nitro. <laughs> Rick Flair could be a consortium. He'd come out and replace Dana White as the president. <laughs> And then who knows, maybe someone from Bellator could be like the NW, I don't know, like Benson Henderson just comes out, of, <laughs> out and steps into the octagon for no reason and starts cutting a promo. But let's, let's get serious here because there have been some headlines in the MMA world that have been uh, capturing, I suppose, people's, um, people's attention. And by the way, a big congratulation to Ariel Hawani on his 400th uh, episode of the MMA Hour because before we get in, into this topic that came from the episode, that, that's, a, that's a remarkable feat. Um, I'm, of course, talking about, though, the, the storyline that came out of the latest episode about uh, where he interviewed Edmund. And Edmund spoke a little bit about Ronda Rousey possibly fighting Chris Cyborg. Edmund said, I want that fight. When I train Ronda, I know Ronda could beat Cyborg. I know that Cyborg is too slow. Casper, we've interviewed Edmund many times before. Uh, we've we've gotten a chance to hang around him. You ran UFC 193. We sort of know the team a little bit. Were you surprised by these comments? Or to you, was this just sort of a way to stay in their headlines for the team and, and possibly 
I suppose, you know, keep things relevant for Ronda Rousey. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe maybe he's just trying to keep the door open. I kind of, you know, when I look at it and I think that Ron, you know, him saying Ronda could beat Cyborg, that Cyborg is too slow, and him saying that he knows that, I, I feel like there would... I mean, there's not really much weight to that because he would be expecting Ronda to beat anybody. And, and, you know, he expected her to beat Holly Holm. Before the Holly Holm fight, he was talking about how Ronda Rousey would run circles around Holly Holm, about how Ronda will outstrike her, it'll be easy, about how Ronda Rousey, you know, drops boxing champions in training. We didn't hear anything before the Nunes fight, but I would find it, you know, hard to believe that he was going to that fight thinking, oh, I don't know, I don't know if he if she can beat Amanda Nunes. So the fact that he has confidence in Ronda Rousey, to me, doesn't really, you know, weigh on... On anything and uh I, I don't know like you, you, you sort of hear his reasoning for why ronda would be more motivated to you know beat cyborg saying that kind of alluding to the fact that she's a bad person her pd history she's hurt girls and the fact that you know ronda would be extra motivated to beat someone like that and i you know i, I don't buy into that at all because you'd think that if ronda was going to be motivated for anybody it would be amanda nunez coming back from her massive fall coming back to beat Amanda Nunes, regain the title, I, I, you know, being in phenomenal shape, at least physically. So I think that Ronda Rousey was at the height of her motivation for that fight, and we saw how that went. And to be honest, I kind of felt that it was a little bit irresponsible, the fact that Ronda Rousey just got beat, beaten by Holly Holm brutally. Well, that was a while ago, but she got beaten by Holly Holm. She got knocked out by Amanda Nunes. And now to suggest that Ronda Rousey is going to go up in weight and fight someone who's bigger, arguably a more devastating striker... I, I, I don't see a reason for that. I don't see a reason to put your, you know, your star pupil through something like that. I understand it's a big money fight, but I don't think there's really anything in it for Ronda Rousey. She would, you know, and I say this with respect. I, I think it's likely she would go in there and given her striking that we saw really nothing, no major improvements in the Amanda Nunes fight, it's a good chance she'd be getting embarrassed against Cyborg. And, and for what? A big payday? Add to her brain trauma? So I... I don't know. I, I, I question it, and I think that as a coach, maybe maybe he should have been a little bit more realistic, and I think it's kind of irresponsible to throw that out there. I don't know whether she put him up to that or he's just sort of going on his, out on his own limb, but obviously she's going to be getting a lot of questions, which you know she probably will not answer, about, hey, so we hear that you know your trainer wants to fight Cyborg. Do you want that as well? So I don't know. What, what do you think, Damon? Yeah, I think you had the best word possible there, and that was irresponsible. I think it's an irresponsible comment to even mention that because now people are buzzing about it as if it's actually you know something that could happen. I mean, if you care about Ronda Rousey and you care about the fact that she's just gotten knocked out two fights in a row, why in the world would you ask for her next fight to go up in weight and then fight one of the most brutal knockout strikers in the mm. history of women's mixed martial arts? I mean, if you want to, if you want to redeem Ronda Rousey. And you want to, you know, you you want her to go out on a win, or you want her to, you know, find a way back. You know, listen, Holly Holm is, you know, one in three in her last four fights. I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that they could set up that rematch right now. Uh, you know, obviously Amanda Nunes is probably a little further out of reach. Um, you know, considering that you know she's still the champion and, and hasn't lost. Uh, but Misha Tate retired. I mean, I'm quite sure that, you know, if Ronda came back and said, I want to fight Misha one more time, I bet you Misha could be talked out of retirement. Mm. Those are the two fights. If you really want to, you know, get Ronda back in there and you really want to redeem her, you know, maybe those two fights. But why in the world? I just don't get it. I don't understand the logic. And especially when, you know, especially when this is a fight that Cyborg desperately wanted when Ronda was at the height of her popularity. That's the time when you ask to fight a Chris Cyborg and you're like, you know what, screw it. Let's let's prove that we are the best in the world. Let's prove that we are the number one pound for pound women's fighter in the world. Let's fight Chris Cyborg. Back then, they wanted no part of Chris Cyborg. And now, all of a sudden, that, that, that Ronda's on, on, you know, maybe the end of her career, that's when you make this? It just makes no sense to me and it just seems like how much do you really care about ronda rousey if that's what you want for her you know what i mean like that's mm. what that's what you're asking for i mean that's really what you, that's really what you think is best for ronda's career and her and her well-being is to fight chris cyborg i just i don't get it it doesn't make any sense it's just as you said i'm still in your word but it seems really irresponsible and it also seems like you just don't really care about her yeah, and to me, you know what? I didn't really read much into it. I'm not sure if he spoke to Ronda or not, but from what I've seen from Ronda Rousey lately, even the stuff that she's been doing with the WWE, it doesn't really look like she's that keen on coming back to fighting. Or even with the pro wrestling stuff, she's a bit meek on that as well. But I liked what Chris Cyborg said about how maybe they could meet in a WWE ring. Who knows? Maybe there's some kind of sneaky plan. Maybe the WWE mentioned something. Maybe they're building up a bit of a program. But there's no doubt about one fact, and that is... 
Ronda Rousey doesn't have the same name value that she had when she was winning fights. And obviously she lost a lot of her movie deals and she lost a lot of those, I suppose, you know, ways to make a lot more money outside the business. So who knows? Maybe Edmund was just trying to pump her up, get her back in the headlines and make her relevant again. But to me, look, I don't doubt that Edmund actually thinks that she can be- beat Chris Cyborg. Mm-hmm. But I think that's the big problem. Opponents have been under underrated by Edmund in the past and it would be very difficult for me to see a, 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 even if she makes millions of dollars in this fight against Chris Cyborg which I don't think she'd come back for I mean she looks happily married and there's a lot more money to be made elsewhere I reckon but even if she did I just it would be a, a horrible uh, thing to watch I think to see her up against Chris Cyborg it, would be, it could be very very difficult for fans to see but at the same time you have so many diehard Ronda Rousey fans out there that after he made those comments even even after everything that's happened, those, those diehard fans believe it, believe that she could do it and would probably spend their money watching the fight. So who knows? Maybe in some ways for Edmund, it was effective. On a side note, though, and touching on what you said about how Ronda Rousey isn't what she used to be and obviously spending money, I still imagine WME, IMG and the UFC would probably spend quite a bit of money to get Ronda Rousey back in there. And I'm assuming... I'm, I'm curious what kind of demands she'd have because for UFC 207, she negotiated a deal and she said, look, I don't want to do media. So I'm, I'm curious whether she'd do something similar. And this is obviously all hypothetical mm. if she was to come back. And if, you know, she, she'd probably have a lot of power. I'm curious what you think, Damon, in the sense of, you know, Ronda Rousey now, what, I think almost almost two years, coming up on two years since her massive fall against Holly Holm where she was seemingly on top of the world. Her fame, while, you know, it, it, it's still there, you can't deny the fact that it it is slowly dwindling, and she's still amazingly famous, but just not what she used to be. What do you think something like that would draw? If you know, for shits and giggles, Ronda Rousey fights Chris Cyborg. What do you think the pay per view buy rate would be for something like that? Because you know, a couple of years ago, people were talking about how maybe that would be you know one of the biggest pay per views of all time. I think it would still be big just because, you know, Chris Cyborg is a well-known name now and, and she's a draw in her own right. And I think Ronda just because of the hype, but I can't imagine that fight would do anything more than maybe 700,000 pay-per-view buys. Now that's not wow. bad. That's a good number, but not anywhere near what it once was. And even that, that's a, that, that might be on the high side. Honestly, we might be talking about 500,000 at most. I mean, Rhonda, the problem that Rhonda has being promoted right now is that when Rhonda lost to Holly Holm, and then when she came back and she lost to Amanda Nunes, there's a certain um, a certain reaction that I think we'd look for in our athletes when they lose or they face defeat, and that's what we want to see out of them to come back. You know, I think the best description of that is Conor McGregor losing to Nate Diaz. You know, after the fight, he was very uh, humble. You know, very humbled by the whole moment. He addressed the media. You know, at that time, he's like, maybe I'll go back to featherweight. You know, all these different things he was talking about. And then, you know, a couple weeks later, he just got really you know motivated to have that rematch with Nate Diaz and that's all he wanted and he got back in there you know four months later five months later and he avenged that loss and 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 he really had that fire about him and we never saw that from Ronda when she lost to Holly Holm when she came home on the plane she's hiding her face she didn't want to be seen by anybody she's kind of you know holed up in her house and I understand okay give her some time to uh, you know, give her some time to react and kind of you know deal with the depression of a loss. But then she never had that fire again. She never seemed to get that excitement again. The only person that was telling us that she was excited was Dana White. Dana, oh, she's mm. motivated. She's <laughs> ready. But but it's it's different when you don't see it from Ronda. And then that week, uh, you know, UFC 207. I was at that fight card, and like her not doing any media. Like to me, that was a big sign. And he kept saying it's because she didn't want to be distracted. She wanted to focus. To me, I always remember a quote. Jens Pulver gave to me, uh, guys, got to be at least eight or nine years ago at this point. We did an interview during fight week of one of his fights at the WEC, and I apologized. I said, Jens, I'm sorry I'm bothering you on fight week. I know you got a fight in like four days, but I appreciate you giving me the time. And he said, Damon, he said the first, he said the time when when 15 minutes of an interview is such a distraction from you getting in the cage and winning a fight, you shouldn't be fighting. Mm. That was his quote, and I love that quote. I, know, I understand you can't do 15 minutes for everybody, but I'm just saying mm. in that in that instance, it made a lot of sense. He's like, if, if a 15-minute interview is going to throw you off so bad that you, that you can't win a fight, you shouldn't be fighting. And I think that w- that's what we saw from Ronda. I don't think she was mentally there to deal with the, the media and the scrutiny and the questions and you know the, the knockout to Holly. I just don't think she's in the right place. And if, if there's going to be more of that, we just haven't seen that from her. And you know what? And my point being is, 
And I'm sorry to go on a long rant here, but my point being is, is it's fine. If she doesn't want to come back, great. Mm-hmm. Go do your thing. I'm happy for you getting married and do WWE and act. I'd be awesome. You know, dude, that's great, Ron, to have a fantastic life. But her coming back, we haven't seen any indication that she even wants to come back. And that, that's kind of one of those things I think that you hit on the nail there, Damon. Not only did she not do any interviews going into the fight, but she still hasn't really done any interviews now. Which is like, well, why don't you speak to someone, explain what's going on in your head? And I think the the truth behind it is she's still trying to come to terms with it mentally. You know, mentally she's Mm. still struggling with it. So we'll see what happens with Ronda Rousey. It looks like there may be some kind of corny WWE run coming up. So look out for that. And by the way, in my perspective, if Ronda Rousey was to come back, I think she could easily make money by fighting a lot easier fights than uh, Chris Cyborg. She could possibly call out Misha Tate for another fight. She could just fight one of the girls one of the lower ranked girls in the bantamweight div- division and they can market that as a fight and then she could win and that could be huge for her so there's pro- a lot of different paths for on rousey to take and from what we understand and even when we spoke to her mom chris cyborg never really looked like an option where she was at her best but speaking of legends and uh, possibly not fighting again michael bisping was on the very same episode of the mma hour speaking about his fight ufc 217 and mentioned this might be the last time I'll ever see Bis- Bisping fight in an octagon. He said, I think the career I've had, the years I've been in the UFC, the injuries I've had, the ups and downs, getting close to title fights and all of this, there's a possibility this might be my last ever fight. I don't know if I'll fight again after this. So what a way to go out if it is. He also went on to say that it is a little bit about the money for him. If there's enough money involved, maybe I'll stick around, he said. But as of right now, I don't know. My family wants me to retire. My wife wants me to retire. There's a lot of people saying, Mike, you should retire. My manager says it. So everyone's in my ear saying, Mike, you should retire. You should retire as champion. I've earned some money along the way. I've had a great career. I've represented my country. I've achieved more through mixed martial arts than I've ever would have dreamed of. We can't keep going forever. You've got to know when the time is right. And I'm not saying time is right, but I'm contemplating it. Kasper Rozalowski, could it be that the last time we see Michael Bisping will be at UFC 217? Yeah, maybe. Look, I mean, when you see Bisping's comments, I think there is a lot of truth to them. At the same time, Bisping's one of those guys, kind of like Chael Sonnen, where when he speaks, I feel like he's always got an agenda. He's always sort of angling at something. And so I don't don't take what he says too literally. I I mean, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if his wife does want him to retire. It wouldn't surprise me if a bunch of people want want him to retire. And he's probably thought about it. He's a smart guy. The only thing I sort of question is his manager. I don't understand why his manager would want him to retire, especially when he's, you know, on, on such a run. And I think Bisping continuing a fight would benefit for his manager so i'm i'm a little bit surprised at that but you know he, he did say how he's got like that netflix special and he's going to be doing acting and things like that and i think for a lot of fighters that's the dream you know fighters didn't really have those opportunities years ago but now the mma is such a you know big sort of transcending sport if you can sort of stop putting your body on the line and go make money doing acting or movies or whatever, that's great. And and honestly, I applaud any fighter that does that. I know a lot of people are down on Bisping because, you know, his his championship run certainly has been legendary. And I, I think in a lot of ways, it's not really his fault. I mean, the UFC wanted him to fight Dan Henderson, and now the UFC want him to fight GSP. What are you going to do? Are you going to turn those fights down and say, sorry, I'm all about the honor, give me Yoel Romero, and I'm, I'm happy to, you know, make less money. So, you know, will, will, will this affect his legacy i think from a fan standpoint i also think he's sort of a bit of an overachiever he's a guy who no one really expected to win the title and now he did and he's you know he's, he's had a long career he's done a lot for the ufc so i i certainly wouldn't i i think if if bisping wants to retire after ufc 217 i see nothing wrong with that he doesn't owe anybody fights not rockhold not whitaker if he doesn't want to do it anymore i'm fine with that i also do feel like there's a little bit of trolling Luke Rockhold just had a big fight. He's been wanting Bisping for a very, very long time. And I think for Bisping to come out and say, hey, uh, I might retire for 217. You'll never get that fight. I think it's a bit of a fuck you to Luke Rockhold. And uh, prob- I-, I don't know, something that may even mess with Luke Rockhold. Because I think for Luke Rockhold, not only does he want to win the belt, but he wants to erase any doubt that Michael Bisping has the edge over him. So I- I'm-, I'm not, I-, I wouldn't be surprised, but I'm not really taking it too literally. What do you think, Damon? Yeah, I mean, listen. If Mike, if Mike wants to retire, I, I and and he goes out on top, he beats George St. Pierre, and, and I'm picking him to beat George St. Pierre. 
uh, and he wants to go out as champion. Why was it, why why do so many people have a problem with that? Mm. I don't understand it. We always ask for we always ask for fighters to go out on top rather than going out on the bottom. You know, we always want fighters every single time. We're like, man, I wish this guy would have left when the getting was good instead of you know going out on three straight knockouts or he didn't know when to walk away or you know I, I remember a quote from uh, some other I can't remember the fighter who told me this, but the fighter said, "I want to be done with the sport before the sport is done with me." And I think we should. Listen, if, if, he, if he's the middleweight champion of the world and he beats George St. Pierre in the biggest pay-per-view of the year and wants to retire, who? why would anyone have a problem with that? I don't understand. He's 38 years old. He's been around for a long time. He already pulled off the most improbable title run in history by beating Luke Rockhold on you know seven days' notice or ten days' notice, where a ridiculous amount of time that was that he went in there and knocked out Luke Rockhold. He pulled that off. He avenged his loss to Dan Henderson, which I know Dan Henderson – wasn't the number one contender, but at the time that Dan Henderson got to fight, there wasn't a clear cut number one contender at that point. Um, you know, if Yoel Romero had, had had laid waste to Robert Whitaker, I could say, okay, well, there's a rivalry fight because Bisping and Yoel Romero have been going at it, you know, on Twitter and through interviews for years. Maybe that's one that you want to have, but he didn't win. Robert Whitaker won, and, and Robert Whitaker is a phenomenal. He's the future of the middleweight division. But is anyone really going to be that jazzed to watch Robert Whitaker and Michael Bisping? I mean, is that going to? Hey, do- we're jazz, Damon. Damn it, <laughs> take our jazz away from us. <laughs> is that is that is that going to do? Is that going to do more than three hundred thousand buys on pay per view? Oh, you know no what I mean? Way. Like that's you know. So so what does he gain? And and I understand Rockhold. I dude, I get it. Rockhold lost. He wants to avenge that. Who doesn't want that? But. You know, Rockhold, even beating David Branch, he's not there yet. I'm sorry. You know, you get knocked out in the first round by a guy on 10 days' notice. You come back and beat David Branch after losing the first round. You don't just immediately jump the line and you get the number one shot. You're going to have to go through, you know, a Yoel Romero or maybe, a, maybe a, you know, a, or, a, or a Jacare Souza or something like that before you get there anyways. Uh, and, 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 and Robert Whitaker, hypothetically, would be the next guy in line anyhow. So, you know, Rockhold would probably be, you know, would, would probably be falling back in line regardless. So... Um, if Michael Bisping wants to retire after George St. Pierre, I think we should stand up and applaud the guy and say, have a great career, man. You're th- he's 38 years old. He has a lot of opportunities outside of fighting. And guess what? He's put together an incredible career. The guy fought everybody. He, I mean, the movie about Michael Bisping would be amazing. Think about this. Mm. Every single time this guy had a ch- chance to get a title shot, he came up short. Like, what, three or four times in his career? Came up short, fought a ton of guys on PEDs throughout his career, fought a ton of cheaters, had his eye completely messed up by a guy jacked up on testosterone, mm. went through all this, got his title, finally got his title shot after beating Anderson Silva, one of the greatest of all time, finally got his title shot on a freaking like two weeks' notice, and then he pulls off the upset and knocks out Luke Rockhold in the first round. If he would have won that title that night and said, I'm done, I don't think anyone could have really complained. Mm. So. To me, celebrate the guy. You know what I mean? Let's celebrate some guy who actually wants to go out on top and actually wants to go out when we're not saying, man, maybe you should retire. Like, I think we should celebrate this. Yeah, and an incredible job promoting a lot of fights where really helping the UFC. He was he was a real champion for the UFC and getting a lot of interest in fights where maybe there wasn't going to be so much interest. And you're absolutely right, Damon. To me, his legacy is just his determination and will to stick in there. If you would have retired against his first fight against Luke Rockhold, where he lost in 2014, I would have said, wow, that guy has had an amazing career. What a run he's had. But this makes absolute sense to me. And, I mean, it makes sense to me that his manager would actually say this. I mean, I think this is a this is an example of a great manager who knows where Bisping is, knows knows what, what's on the line, and, and knows when a good time to go out is. So he, they're probably very close. And and him saying for Bisping to retire, I know you know we had the coach on, and and, and Jason Perillo spoke to us a little bit about it and his thoughts on it. But my thoughts on it is, you know, why not retire? He's got these great opportunities, beating GSP and and hanging it up after that, and going out after such a massive fight, the biggest fight in his career against G- GSP in Madison Square Garden, finishing it on a high note. And this is great because if he does decide that he wants to return and fight. It's much better than if he sticks around as the middleweight champion. If he sticks around as the middleweight champion, he's got to fight all these killers like Yoel or maybe fight Luke Rockhold again and all these other people. If he retires, goes and does his Netflix thing, maybe does a few movies, and if there's another big money fight in the future, he can pull a GSP or a Conor McGregor and just come back for one of those if he really, really wants to come back and fight. But at 38 years old, there's no doubt to me that he's past his peak athletically, and he's really not the same fighter that he once was. So I think this is a great way for him to go out against GSP. If he loses against GSP, he doesn't lose too much. If he wins against GSP, it's a good way to go out. 
And um, I, I agree with you, Damon. Although I would like to see him fight Robert Whitaker, I think if I'm Michael Bisping, that fight makes absolutely no sense to me whatsoever. Why put everything on the line? And really have there's no there's no reward for Bisping. If he does beat Whitaker, a lot of people would have said, oh, you know, it's 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 Whitaker. Maybe he wasn't as good as we thought he was. And, and if Whitaker beats him, then people will say, oh, see, Michael Bisping was never that great to begin with. So a, a good way for him to retire. And I actually I hope he does retire and go on and do these things and focuses on his projects. But Casper, we mentioned Luke Rockhold briefly. Uh, Rockhold had a win over the weekend. It wasn't the most impressive performance. We saw there were some defensive flaws in his game. And also it took a little bit longer than well, it didn't take longer than people thought. But, you know, it did look a little bit sketchy at times for Rockhold. Now people are wondering now that he's back in action. What is next for him? What would you like to see happen for Luke Rockhold next? Is there an opponent in mind that you've got for him while this whole just G, uh, GSP Bisping thing gets sorted out? Well, that, yeah, and that's the thing. Like, it's it's not just the GSP Bisping thing. It's the GSP Bisping and Robert Whitaker thing. You got to mm. imagine that Robert Whitaker will be the next in line to face. I mean, who knows? It, it could potentially be uh, Robert Whitaker versus Luke Rockhold for the you know for the. Well, it would be the undisputed title if, if you know, Bisping won and then he retired afterwards. But if Bisping is sticking around, it's Robert Whitaker versus Bisping next. I think with Luke Rockhold and Bisping, of course, there's a massive rivalry. But I don't think the UFC are really all that inclined to push Luke Rockhold ahead of the of the rankings because UFC 199, if you look at the pay-per-view buy rates, and that... That was and that was a fucking heated rivalry between Luke Rockhold and Bisping, and you had the heated rivalry between Uriah Faber and Dominic Cruz, and it didn't draw well. It, it was it was around the I think mid to low three hundred thousand mark, or who knows, maybe it was even up as high as three hundred ninety thousand, but I don't think so. And you know when you have fights like that, you don't even get you know the champions they don't even get pay per view points on that. So I don't think the UFC are going to be you know rushing Luke Rockhold up the rankings. I think in the meantime. Maybe he fights a guy like Yola Romero, maybe even Chris Weidman. I think Jacare's lost a little bit of steam. I know Rockhold kind of denies the fact that that Weidman rematch uh, has any relevance, but, you know, that's that's a, a bit of a juicy rivalry in on its own. It was supposed to happen originally at UFC 199, and, you know, Romero and Rockhold, I think that's a very intriguing matchup. I think, like you mentioned, Rockhold looked very vulnerable at times, even in his win over Branch, and uh, with Romero, even though Whitaker beat him, it, it's not like he really... Uh, you know, lost too much steam. I don't think he was too exposed. I think people would still find that pretty intriguing. You know, can Romero find Rockhold's chin? How does it, you know, how does his cardio hold up after five rounds? So for me, that's the picks. Romero or Weidman? What do you think, Damon? Yeah, I think uh, I think Romero is probably the you know the most likely candidate. I mean, I would still watch a Jacare rematch. I mean, they fought a few years ago, but uh, yeah, I think I think Romero is probably the most likely candidate in that in that situation. I mean, as you said, he didn't really lose a lot of steam, you know, coming out of that fight with Whitaker. I mean, he lost the fight. Whitaker definitely won the fight. Uh, but, you know, I, but I, I think he's still a viable candidate. And, you know, there's a little bit of bad blood there. You know, they had a little bit of trash talk around this card in Pittsburgh that they, uh, you know, they were talking about making Rockhold and Romero and it didn't come together. So I think that's the most likely candidate. And, you know, it doesn't really mess with anything else that's going on. I mean, you got Whitaker, you know, kind of waiting uh, for, you know, Bisping to come back or, you know, another number one contender. But he's already rolled through pretty much everybody. I mean, he, you know, he beat, you know, he beat, he beat Jacare and Romero within a three month span. I mean, he beat the other guys in the division. Uh, and I don't think either one of those should be right back in there with a rematch this soon. So, you know, if, if, if Bisping retires after November, then Whitaker may be sitting there kind of wondering who he's going to fight. So you hope that, you know, maybe some of these other matchups can come together to really find him a number one contender. Mm. And Damon, as we wrap up, you know, over the weekend, there was some extra controversy in the boxing world. We all know what happened between Canelo Alvarez and Triple G. The uh, the score was not pretty for a lot of people, and a lot of boxing fans got pretty cross with how it all played out, especially <laughs> with another rematch announced. But the biggest story kind of coming out of this is Adelaide Bird, who is a boxing referee, and she's been pretty controversial in the past in terms of her judging, especially in boxing and the UFC. There's still a chance that she could be judging UFC 216. Uh, the Nevada Athletic uh, Commission Executive Director Bob Bennett told MMA Fighting on Monday that there's been no decision made yet with regards to Bird judging UFC 216 on October 7th in Las Vegas. Of course, there's been some other comments from him as well, where Bennett told the Independent on Monday that he'll be giving Bird a small break before putting her back into the scoring fights. Where are you at in terms of Bird and her future and scoring? And if she is put at UFC 216, do you think there could be further issues and further impact on fights like she's had in the past? 
Well, you know, I, I talked to Bob Bennett myself yesterday, and he told me the same thing. He said the reports that she was being, you know, taken off of UFC 216 or that she was being given a break were absolutely incorrect. Uh, he said he's not made any kind of decision. He's not made any kind of decision with her, which you know, yeah, it is unfortunate. You'd hope they'd react quickly and say, okay, maybe we should pull her. You know, you, you want you want these officials to be held accountable. And I understand judges and referees have the most thankless jobs in the industry because when they do a great job, we don't praise them. Uh, when they screw up, though, we just, you know, we obliterate them. And so I understand it's a very thankless profession, but it's still a profession. You have to do your job. And she did her job very poorly on Saturday night. Uh, 118 to 110 for Canelo is awful. I mean, that's awful. Um, so if she does judge at UFC 216, first things first, I know she's not judging the main event. They've already declared the judges for the main event with Tony Ferguson and Kevin Lee. She is not one of those judges. I'd have a hard time believing they're going to assign her to Demetrius Johnson <laughs> and Ray Bork. If, if, and Yikes. this is a big hypothetical, if she ended up working the event at all, I think it would be for a couple lower card bouts. But personally, I don't think she's going to end up working at all. I think ultimately what's going to play out is that she will end up taking a break, but I don't think they're going to publicize it because I think the Nevada State Athletic Commission is trying to save themselves and her a little bit of embarrassment by not saying, yeah, she's being put on timeout. We're putting her in the corner uh, and, and, and calling timeout on her. I think they're just not going to sign her. You just won't see her name pop up for the next, you know, several months when these big fight cards come up. And that's going to be their way of, you know, quietly, you know, handling the situation. Well, I'll tell you what, it's going to be interesting to see. Imagine if she was in the Demetrius Johnson Ray Borg fight and that thing went to a decision. Jeez. Me and Casper saw a bad Demetrius Johnson decision in Australia once where it got announced incorrectly, and people may be, may be seeing that again at you, UFC. You know who would win in that fight? Leonard Garcia via split decision. Guarantee it. <laughs> <laughs> and that was an Adelaide Jeez, Bird so. card right there. So how about that? That was. Jeez. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be an interesting one. But, Damon, again, we appreciate you coming onto the program. Of course, nerdcoremovement.com, that's a place to go to check out all your information on pop culture, world and movies, TV shows, everything. Damon does an amazing job. And, of course, check out the Fight Society podcast. Damon, any, any announcements for the podcast this week? Who are the guests that people can check out? Uh, we're going to be talking to uh, UFC 216 headliner Kevin Lee. We're also going to talk to uh, Boss Rutten. And then coming up next week, uh, we're going to be talking to Paige Van Zandt as she makes her return to the UFC in the flyweight division. Uh, we're also going to be talking to Jessica I coming up here in the next week or so. And uh, also going to talk to uh, – also going to have some more guests. I know we got Mickey Gall coming on as well. So, yeah, a lot, a lot of good guests coming up uh, in the next couple weeks. Jeez, Damon. Can you keep it down? We're trying to keep, keep people listening to our podcast. <laughs> These lineups are killing us. Bastard, that's a vicious I, I learned, radio, damn it. He's a I vicious learned, radio I, person. I learned, it from, I learned it from watching you, all right? I learned it from watching you. <laughs> all right. Well, big thanks to all of our other guests on the on the show this week. Of course, Don Fry for coming on and giving us a lowdown on what's going on. Jason Perillo is always a pleasure to have on the program as well. Jorge Masvidal for talking about this big fight against Stephen Thompson. Connor Rebush for coming on and really breaking things down into detail and explaining how it all works. And, of course, you guys are tuning in. Damon Martin, of course, for doing an amazing job. We will be taking a break next week. But we will be back the week after, so enjoy a little little break from Submission Radio. Try not to miss us too much, but of course, still available on Twitter, Facebook. If you have a message, if you have a comment down below here on YouTube, if you're watching right now, show it to us, give it to us, send it to us, and give us an uh, iTunes review if you so please. We love reading your reviews. We love seeing what you guys have to say. And until then, in a week, we will catch you guys. Have a great time and a great weekend, and we'll catch you then.